Okay, well, welcome, uh, dispensing competition committee members. I'd like to read something that Sid, our new president, has uh, written, and then or maybe I should call the letter first. You can read the welcome letter. Okay, I'll read the welcome letter first. Okay, this is what Sid, our new president, has written. Uh, on behalf of the State Board of Optometry, welcome to the launch of the Dispensing Competition Committee. And thank you for volunteering your time to public service. I am quite excited to move forward with the startup of this committee as it not only fulfills the board's regulatory requirements, but it also establishes a new and productive partnership with competitions throughout the state. To get us started, I have appointed Ruby Garcia as committee chair and Bill Casella as vice chair. Together, this leadership team brings strong knowledge and expertise in the optician area and history of the defining bill of AB 684. As you meet today, please keep in mind that your the overarching goal is to serve in an advisory capacity to the board, keeping our mission to protect the health and safety of California consumers as a forefront of discussions. We look forward to receiving your list of priorities that may span such topics as licensing, education, regulation, as well as your proposed timeline to address or review at the board's August meeting. Ruby, Bill, Anna, Khan, thank you again for representing California consumers on this important committee. And this is from Sid. Thank you. So I wanted to call Roll and uh, Anna is here. Okay, Bill. Morning. And Ron and myself, we are here. So we've established that all the uh, committee members are present. And we can move on to an item. And how about, uh, are there any public uh, people who would like to introduce themselves? And I know that there's a sign of friends. So if anyone wants to introduce who we are or where from. Okay, well, I am Jessica, the executive officer of the board, and with me we have staff with Kelly Flores and Jessica Swan. Um, Jessica Swan uh, is the RDO coordinator, so she's the sole person responsible for uh, the RDO program right now, and so she knows firsthand the types of questions that we're getting and the, the matters that um, would probably need to be addressed. Uh, Kelly um, was doing that position prior to Jessica, and Kelly also helps out with all the board member um, activities as well. So staff joined us today. Uh, we also have our legal counsel here. We get two. Um, you want to introduce yourself? Well, uh, we can. It's such a dangerous bunch, I think, that we need two people to watch over you. So my name is Kurt Eppel. I'm the supervising attorney with the Department of Consumer Affairs. And I'm Mina Hamilton. I um, will be attorney three, transitioning to optometry. Yeah, he was joking. You guys aren't aren't dangerous. It's just we we have a new council, so for it's transitioning, Mina. So that's why we have two. All right. Now we've established uh, our role, and now for item number two, are there any public comment on items that are not on the agenda? This will be anybody's opportunity to address the committee on things that are not on the agenda. Ms. Seifram, and if I'm not mistaken, we got a some sort of a missive or letter or position statement from. We we did yesterday. Uh, we received a proposed state or a, a position okay. statement from Cato, that's the California Association of Dispensing Opticians. Um, I do believe that they're going to join us today. Uh, but they want they requested that we send that out to the members um, for them to read. Uh, and so we are entering that in um, as a public document. We'll consider that part. We'll consider that part of the public of the comments made under this agenda. All right. Now, uh, Jessica, we're moving into agenda item number three. All right. So thank you for coming. Um, our goal, uh, because as you may have gathered. There, there's a lot of, of things to, for this committee to tackle. Um, and so our goal, knowing that some of you are, are brand new to, to serve as a, a board member or a committee member, um, we wanted to provide you as much information up front as possible. So when you're uh, deciding what kind of, of statutes or regulations you want to put in place, you understand the, 
the dynamics that, that you're regulating. Uh, with that, I've, I've requested uh, all stakeholders would participate in the meeting. Those who can't participate, we wanted to have webcasts. We typically don't webcast committee meetings, but I think that this committee is really important. Um, so we ask that all of these committee meetings are going to be webcast. Um, so with that, we kind of wanted to do a breakdown. We wanted to go over just the responsibilities of the board in general, um, the licensing, regulatory oversight, and enforcement. Uh, we're doing, wanting to let you know what the registration types are that, for the RDO committee um, under the RDO program and what those registration requirements are for. Um, we're going to go give you a couple licensing and enforcement stats, and then we're also going to go over just a quick overview of, of uh, the creation of the committee, why you were created, and what you're tasked with doing. So with that, we get started. So first and foremost, uh, it's a statute that so we are mandated, the board is mandated to have consumer protection as the highest priority. And whenever it's inconsistent with other factors, you will always go to what's for the consumer. Um, so oftentimes you're going to get a lot of other interested parties, you're going to get associations who advocate, advocate for the profession. Um, whether you are a public member or a professional member, you are all here right now for the consumer. Um, so I know sometimes people think that the professional members are here to advocate for the profession on the board, and that's not the case. You're here as a member, to, a person to protect the public. So the professional members bring a lot of knowledge and expertise that the public members might not have, um, which is important to help with the decision making. Um, but everybody is here for the public and the public only. All right, this is the world we're looking at. These are the statutes and the regulations. Statutes are done through the legislature and regulations are done through the board. And those go through the OAL process office and ministry of law. They uh, review all that and we're gonna have training later on from Natalie. Um, she's gonna go and overview with that. But this is this is the world we're gonna focus in um, the next several years. Uh, a lot of these statutes haven't been touched in, all, in over three decades. Um, the most recent one, if you see a, in the statute, it will say when it was most recently updated, you'll see a January 1, 2017. All of that was related to AB 684, which we'll go into, uh, but those, that's why it's a recent date. Otherwise, they weren't touched in quite some time. So these, um, I, these are all hyperlinks in here, so all of you are able to quickly go to all those sections that we're going to have to tackle. Um, if you haven't read through them yet, I do recommend doing so. It is a great read, um, and I, we're going to have to um, go through all of them, not today, but um, at some point. All right, so for those of you who've taken uh, board member orientation training, uh, this slide, uh, the verbiage is is taken right from Kurt. Uh, so kind of given an overview of the licensing, regulatory, oversight, and enforcement methods. Um, you have developing your licensing standards, you're adopting regulations, and your disciplinary actions that board takes. This committee is not tasked with deciding any disciplinary matters or any enforcement matters, but you are tasked with, um, well actually in statute, you're tasked with reviewing disciplinary guidelines for the RDO program except there are some disciplinary guidelines. So you're gonna be tasked with first creating those guidelines in order to review them. If you have any questions, let's jump in. Who is, who is uh, responsible for the uh, enforcement? The board. So the board will still, we still investigate all the cases. The board are the ones who will see those decisions. Uh, but the, and we have our deputy attorney general liaison, she's going to give a more of an overview of what your role is into the disciplinary guidelines. So the disciplinary guidelines that you will create, it's going to be used by administrative law judge. It's going to be uh, used by us when we're looking at settlement terms. So it all, um, and the board will use those too because if there's any kind of settlement terms or even an ALJ decision uh, that strays from the disciplinary guidelines, they're going to have to say why they strayed from it. So that, those disciplinary guidelines are, are key to the entire enforcement process. <coughs> All right, 
right, first and foremost, we wanted to go over what, what a license is, um, because not all professions are licensed, um, but there are quite a few of them under DCA that do require a license. And a license is um, issued to qualified individuals. And so for the application process, it starts with the applicant proving that they meet the qualifications that set in statute and regulations to receive that license. So if you think of the burden, the burden's on the um, applicant to prove that they are qualified for the license. It's a little different once we issue that license, then it's, it, it's more on, um, it's like a material that they own. And so for renewals, um, we should be streamlining that process to make sure that it's, it's pretty um, smooth. And then for enforcement, there's a process that we have to go through the enforcement process to take that license away. And the burden's on us to prove that they are no longer fit to practice. So um, we are gonna use the term license in statute though, it's called a registration. Um, and that's just more of a semantics and what I'm finding is that the, using the term registration when I'm talking to um, the other boards in other states, they are thinking that by us using the term registration, it is an option and that it's not required to get in order to practice. So there is a, a regulatory board association and when I had talked to them, they thought, yeah, but California doesn't need to participate because it's just an option to get it because it's just a registration that they opt into. And I explained, no, it, it's something that they have to have. And so I think that just that term is causing confusion. So maybe you want to look at changing it just to license because that's what it is. But just when you hear the term registration, it's essentially a license. So um, licensing is for consumer protection. Licensing is not to uh, protect the profession. It's also not supposed to put any unnecessary barriers onto, the, onto entry. Uh, I think this needs to be uh, always kept in your mind when you're looking at these statutes. I think when they were created, um, I, they were created, like I said, uh, several decades ago, some just maybe a decade or two. But I think that the world has changed since then. Um, it, technology has evolved. I think the practice itself has evolved. So when you're looking at these statutes, keep that in mind. Or, well, it might have been great during that time. Is it still necessary to protect the consumer? Or is there another way to do it to still adequately protect them? Um, I did want you guys to be aware when you're looking at these statutes and regs is to keep in mind the little Hoover Commission. They are a subset of the legislature and they um, provide oversight and want to um, provide reports for how government is running for government efficiency and so they oftentimes look at different governmental agencies and make recommendations. In 2016, I provided a link to that report. I do recommend reading the report because it goes through uh, the topic of occupational licensing. Um, and whether or not it's needed in order to adequately protect the consumer. So when we're talking about, um, I know there, there's one section where we may look at adding more requirements such as continuing education or education as part of getting the registration. Just keep in mind, is that necessary for consumer? And if so, then we have to be able to, show, to say why it's necessary. No, only just yes, I was sitting there. No, but I just think it's important to remember that licensing is a minimum qualifications game. So that the second you meet the threshold, that's when you get your license. I took the bar exam. You took the bar exam. They read the terms. You don't you don't get like a better license if you got a ninety five, and you're not a better lawyer if you got a ninety eight. The second you pass the bar, that's when you issue license. So it just it's important on the frontier. The second like the high jump. Once you get over the high jump. Qualifications. That's what we should license. We don't have, you don't have gradations of licensure depending on how many years you're in school or whatever. So just licensing is kind of like, unlike Canada, it's kind of like the floor. So, yeah. Thank you. That's actually a, a great point because we get that a lot. Um, with standard of care, or um, or what the the standard is, the we look at the minimum standard. We, while we'd like everybody to want to be at that gold standard. 
we, that's not what we regulate. We regulate the minimum standard to entry and the minimum standard of care when you're practicing with the patient. So I gave you a, a little excerpt from the uh, Little Hoover Commission uh, to highlight what they're looking at and to kind of give you an idea of their frame of mind when they're looking at these statutes. All right, so we go into the registration types. You have the first is the registered dispensing optician. Those are the individuals, corporations, or firms that are registered to fill prescription lenses written by physicians or surgeons or optometrists. And they also take facial measurements, fit, adjust, lenses, and frames. And there's an asterisk down there because it requires a dual license uh, for a spectacle lens dispenser or a contact lens dispenser to be tied to that RDO. Um, and then you have the RDO requirements. And these are the only requirements in order to get an RDO is that they have to be on forms prescribed by the board um, and kind of have a signature of individual general partners or president of the secretary of the corporation. So um, with with that, when you hear, when you see through the statutes, it says applications uh, prescribed by the board. So generally when it says that, you're supposed to have a corresponding regulation that says what that form is and the requirements that are on there. You can either list it or just incorporate the form by reference. Uh, none of the RDO applications have any forms incorporated by reference. Um, so that's obviously something that we're going to have to tackle. Um, and when we look at these applications, we want to ask ourselves, are these things that are, are justified for consumer protection? And why do we need these sections? Because, um, and now we will go through the regulation process, but for each thing that we collect on the form, we're going to have to justify with a necessity uh, for why that is needed. <coughs> Which I provided a sample, and there's a couple things on here that... Um, let me just preface it with a lot of the stuff that Medicare did, they used uh, forms that they had done for physicians and surgeons and their other professions that they help regulate. They, so a lot of the requirements are carried over just because they wanted to be consistent of all. So one of the things, though, um, that, I, that we're finding is a, is a little uh, much, I think, is the requirement to have each application notarized. Um, we don't do that for optometrists. I don't know of many boards, Kurt might know, that actually require that physical notary. Uh, but when we're looking at, we, we just put all of the applications online um, so they're able to go, and that's something that wasn't done for the medical board in the past. That went live in the middle of June. Um, so they can now go and apply online, renew online, and change their address all online so it's much quicker. Um, but because this application has a notary requirement, they have to, they'll can print it out and then they still have to go get it notarized and have it sent to us for us to process. Uh, that's one process that's not a requirement in statute or regulation, so I think that's more of a policy decision from the board is to, re to remove that notary requirement. Um, and then we would also ask that you would recommend that the board um, allow staff to process applications without that notary. Uh, it's not going to require any red change or statutory change, and I think that's a policy decision that can be made now. There's other requirements that are in statute that you might want to look at. We can't do a policy change with that. We would have to go through the process to change the statute for the red. So any questions so far? Go ahead. No, I was going to say, so you're just uh, reviewing it at this point, and then later on we'll talk more about it. If you guys have, want to talk about each item, that's I, it's up to you. Um, well, I immediately took a note. I imagine in the course of, of our introduction here, you'll mention some other. Like, this seems like a low hanging fruit, no brainer that we could just immediately. Make our recommendation to the board, and they can handle it at their next meeting, and get it out of the way and move on. And I don't know if you have a kind of a list of those kinds of things that we can just knock out right away. Um, but it would make sense right. to do the, the most straightforward things now yeah. uh, to make that recommendation. Yeah. 
Is that something you're recommending? But so my thought is to like, are we going to hear like a list of these things or? I'm pretty sure they're going to be a lot easier to clean up, but no, um, most of them are governed by the statutes and how they intermingle with each other. Sure. This, to me, was one of the things that we can do now, though, um, but there's not many of those. So we make a note of that now, and then in the part of the agenda where we're doing our actions, we'll... Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. So I think with Mr. Cassell, I think that's probably five or five or seven, but I have a note on it for this item that we'll discuss it. We're going to make the recommendation with this one. And uh, I don't know if I said, but that that notary, this while this is an app from the application for the RDO, it's on every single application. Just I wanted to point out that the regulations that you mentioned, but those are the regulations like for the application, and then like where I can like kind of determine how what information you can kind of pull from or look for is like later on in the regulation that says like, oh, the business has to be at a health facility for this or that. So then it's like, I have a statute. Yeah. Right. I would like Google the address. So it's like, it is bare minimum when it comes to that type of regulation. So it's like, you kind of have to do this sort of, this sort of thing when you're looking to try to find out what what to do. So if it's clear and be easier for the public and for people processing the applications. Yeah. Just, I just had a quick question. Um, uh, 2552 requires the application be verified. Yes. So is that where the notary came from, do you think, suppose, or how, what's the alternative to verify? Other than so for optometrists, we do an attestation statement. Um, that they are they are certified under penalty of perjury. Um, so there's a statement in there that would serve for the same purpose as what this notary. Contemplate then changing the notary requirement to attestation requirement. There's actually no notary requirement. No, uh, I'm sorry. The verified in both as we were previously using as a notary. You're you're saying we're going to to meet the. Statute requirement to verify your oath, you're suggesting that that would be placed with an attestation statement and that would suffice? That would Perhaps, but that I mean, that would be the dispensing um, optician committee to recommend to the board to do. Okay, you have then you have the spectacle and suspenser and the contact lens dispenser. Well, it is called a dispen it ends with dispenser, these are not registrations to dispense. They are registrations to fit and adjust. So you have a spectacle lens dispenser, which registers to fit and adjust spectacle lenses, contacts, instead of fit and adjust contact lenses. So that's also a, a pretty big misconception that we're getting with the profession. The public, really anyone we talk to, when they hear the term, because that's how it is in statute, they think it's a registration to dispense the lenses, and it's not. It's a, it's a registration to only fit and adjust. If you're dispensing, you may be tied to an RDO, which is doing it inside that location. Um, so I think um, so, sorry I have to interrupt you. You have to be a little oh, okay. thank you. You um you know the we you know the difference between an RDO and dispensing and maybe you can clarify that, maybe give an example just about that. So the RDO is you think of it, although it says individual, it's more of the, the location. So you have lens crackers and Walmart and Costco and all the, the RDO physical locations. And then within that, if they're fitting and adjusting lenses, you would have the CLD or SLD tied in that location to it to fit and adjust the lenses. So um, while the, the RDO, the requirement was for them to apply and pay a fee, the, uh, it's the same for the SLDs and the CLDs, except they also have to pass a national exam. Uh, this national exam, you have one for the um, spectacles and you have one for the contact lens dispensers. Uh, those, the national exam was actually an item of 
our sunset report, they looked at the passing rates of the national exam for the profession, and they're pretty low um, compared to the other, the other states. Uh, like we look at why, because I think it's only regulated in 21 other states. A lot of them have educational requirements um, for that registration. So in order for them to take the exam, they have the educational requirements to do that. So I think a lot of them are more prepared to take that national exam, which is why I think we would have a lower pass rate. Oh, and I think that's something that I didn't mention either. This this profession is not regulated in all states. It, it's only the I think just 21. And some of the correct me even better, but I think it's I think it's 21 states where it's regulated right now. Um, so that's also something to keep in mind when you're thinking of adding additional requirements um, to receive this registration or renewal requirements. Just keep in mind the kind of setting that we're in. Sorry, Jessica. You mean the dispensing competition uh, license, or for the SLD and CLD for the twenty-one? So for the SLD and CLD, those are indi the individual license right. types, and for th those are the only ones who have to take a national exam. Okay. And RDO, they just have to pay a fee and do the application. Right. So um, for those, other states may require education. We do not, which could it explain why it's a lower pass rate. Um, oh, and another thing to point out too is they don't have any requirement to pass a law exam. So they don't have to know any of the laws that regulate them prior to getting that registration. Also, um, most states that do regulate also require some type of um, like externship hours prior to registration or getting a license. So the statutes do allow for unlicensed practice, and it's, we're not consistent on how we're allowing it, but we allow it. Um, and it, for the SLDs, and I give you the statute there, it's under if if you are working under the direct responsibility and supervision of a registered uh, dispenser, then you can do that. Uh, there's no cap under SLDs. Uh, but and it allows for that direct supervision. Uh, it allows for the usual and customary absences, including illness and vacation. So um, if they want to go on vacation for six months, a year, if they have an extended illness, this makes it a little difficult as far as the implementation side and the enforcement side to really see at what point is that direct supervision still there. Um, and then for the CLDs, they, we don't allow illness or vacation, um, but they do have a cap. As, um, they can't do more than three contact lens uh, trainees. Another thing that you'll notice um, going through these statutes and regulations, the terms are not consistent. Um, you can have a whole bunch of different terms for one person, and so I think when we're looking through that, that should be one of the things we just, we will have certain definitions and then keep them all the same. So the clarification is that uh, if you're like an assistant to or an apprentice to or whatever, an SLD, you don't need a license right. as long as they're generally supervising your work. Right. Um, but theoretically, we can, by regulation, add meat to what it means to be a customary absence of this or We could say right. not to yeah, exceed right. two weeks at one time. So the other registration type is we have non-resident contact lens sellers. Um, so those are the one eight hundred contacts. Go ahead. So, do we know in practice like how um, one of these these retail operations work, which is the RDO? So they have one of those for the location, and they do they just have one person who's an SLD or a CLD? 
he's like the manager of the facility and then the rest of the people are just like retail workers or P potentially and it, though that's how the site is written to allow that um, i do know that some business models are moving more toward pushing that license because they they would like their employees to be licensed um but that the statute is structured to where it would allow that so specifically like with um uh, like i know with walmart they allow um they like want all of their people licensed as soon as, soon as possible, um, and um, a lot of the the stores they really want to get their legal license as well. So um, it's just different per location, um, and then smaller mom and pop shops will have their um, they'll, they'll probably only have like one or two people, but most of them are licensed. We've seen issues for the public from uh, trainees um, that are don't have necessarily training or the supervision uh, that are affecting uh, people, the public, getting you know well-fitted lenses and stuff. Is that is that one of the issues that we're having with uh, uh, these these RDOs? So I think that that would be one matter that is worth looking into to see if that is adequate to protect the, the consumer. So maybe when we get to the United States, that would be one of them that we put on there um, to really delve into to see if that is protecting the public. So that uh, we have the non-resident contact lens sellers. Like I said, that's the 1-800 contacts, and I think there's a lot of others out there that I can't think of right now. Um, but those are uh, any person, look, as a person located outside of California who ships, mails, delivers in any manner, uh, contact lenses at retail to a patient at a California address. Um, this is only a requirement for contacts. There is not one for spectacle lens dispensers. The, the uh, no resident contact lens seller it is uh, applied on forms and to pay a fee they have, in order to obtain and maintain the registration. Um, they have to comply with 2546.5, which I put the link to that statute as well. We don't want to have any public comment at any time. Just feel free to jump in. Any? <coughs> Thanks, Chris. Okay, so here um, is our application received by the fiscal year. So this is um, pretty interesting, at least to my standpoint. We acquired the program AB 684 took effect January 1, 2016. Uh, and there was a lot of talk of what that was going to do to the profession. Um, and we were expecting, and a lot of people were, were referring to a, a gold rush of um, applications coming in as soon as that took effect. Uh, and you're not, we're not seeing it yet, but I do know that there's other companies who are looking at expanding over the next year or two. So we might see it, but right now it's still kind of gradual. These are. You have the RDOs, the SLEs, CLDs, the NCLS. Those are applications that we've received. And so obviously the non-resident contact lens sellers are actually routinely, but the other ones are all following the, the just the general trend. What was interesting to me too is the enforcement, these are enforcement cases received. So this is not the board taking any action or doing any investigations. These are enforcement cases that we've received, and you can see um, that it took a pretty big jump in 16-17. Um, so we would have received the program halfway through the fiscal year of 15-16, uh, and then you see the, the jump. We're looking into this to find out what is causing it. I'm interested in knowing where these complaints are coming from, the source of the complaint, and the type of the complaint. Uh, because I don't, um, I know that we have not received a lot of complaints related to the 684 issues. So it created uh, landlord-tenant relationships that weren't previously allowed. Uh, but the complaints that we're getting are not overly tied to that. So it's not really correlating to this big jump in enforcement cases. Uh, and so we're really looking to where this is coming from. Um, 
because the when the prior fiscal year is at medical board, um, I would have assumed that they, it would be the same number of received, maybe not the same number of closed or actions taken. Um, but this was one of the, the things that we weren't entirely anticipating as far as that such a big jump in what we received. So we're looking into this and we can bring updates to find out more about where this is coming from. So, is there a sense of what generally, even going back to 13, 14, what types of complaints are there? I don't see this like physicians and even optometrists where you have those that you can make care issues right. and still be making a bad um, uh, clinical decision that has a bad outcome at some point. Are these bad outcomes? Yeah, I was dizzy when I put my glasses on and I took them back and they wouldn't put new lenses in or... Yeah, so some we get, we get those where the dispensers are, because when you dispense lenses, they have to be to the ANSI standards, um, the, the national standards um, for dispensing the quality of the lens, how the lens uh, needs to be, where the bifocal line is, it's pretty technical, they have to meet those standards. So we get those complaints where it, this isn't working, where it wasn't fitting and adjusting, and so I don't know if you've worn glasses before, but if it's not fitting right and you try to walk out, it's like, it can... Right. 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 The first thing you do is you go back to wherever you got them and you right. say that they say, oh. And they and fix they, it. They and fix they, it yeah, and exactly. Solved. So we don't, we actually don't get a lot of those complaints, but we've seen them. Or if um, the dispenser did the lens, we've had it where it was completely upside down. Or it was just the right. way that they did it, it was just wrong. So we, I mean, we see those. It's not a lot of them. A lot of the, but what also um, that I'll touch on later is, um, this profession, this trade, is also taught in prisons, uh, and so they a lot of times they come out the door, they come to us with a conviction, and so we have to investigate every single conviction that happens, and so you're going to get a, a And that's done. treated as an enforcement case. Right, right. Ah, uh, I see. Right. Uh, other ones that we notice, um, we have unlicensed practice, so if they are not uh, registered and they're operating, that's unlicensed practice that we see a good amount of. Uh, we And I think a lot of it also has to do with the fact that, and I'll get into this later about outreach to the profession, they don't know who we are. Uh, they don't. They didn't know who the medical board was. They didn't know um, who, who regulates them. They didn't know the difference between their license and the certification. Um, go ahead. So the unlicensed uh, providers mm -hmm. that we get a lot of or it's probably a high percentage of these it's like how does that happen because we have essentially a sophisticated industry and then these mom and pop shops but theoretically that's all they do and they just miss it they don't like how does that yeah, so happen that you're going to go into this business and you it's like people don't just go and start cutting hair they might quietly do it in the garage but that's different than uh calling up a, a frame retailer or wholesaler so you could retail them it seems to me there's a lot more to this than yeah. it, that accident well and i think also um, we we find a lot of the profession who they go when they that's a requirement to get their license they have to take the national exam. Well, once they pass that national exam, they get a certification from the ABO, the American Board of Optitionary. They give a certification, and so there's there's individuals out there that think that certification allows them to then go and start practicing, and they don't even know that they have to get a license with the state. And so they they want to renew their certification, and they go and they do that through ABO, and they, and they think that they're good. And they would have another state where they didn't got it. Right, yeah. So there's Perfect. a lot of confusion to the profession. Yeah, another is the a licensed practice for the, the cosmetic contact lenses, the Plano lenses for Halloween sure. time, Comic-Con. Uh, we get that as well. Just back to your, um, your comment about doing the uh, ticket as a important case for those who are trained in prison shape So what are you looking for specifically when you guys are evaluating these cases? 
the conviction cases. So we look at, um, under, there is a regulation for criteria of rehabilitation. So each, each case that we have, we can gather all of the evidence, anything surrounding that conviction. We measure it up to the regulations to find out if this person is indeed rehabilitated or if we're concerned that this person is going to pose a danger to the public. Um, and then go from there. But it's, it's all set, that process is set out by re the regulation. I would, would temper that statement just a little bit. If you have a license, we have a registration already, and you come to, and we find out about it, and you've been convicted of something, the first question we ask as a regulatory for is that conviction substantially related to the practice. Because if you were arrested for protesting nuclear power, I'm not quite sure what nuclear power would have to do with the practice of dispensing or fitting. So that, in that Hopefully nothing. <laughs> sorry. In that case, we would probably take no action because the discretion is vested in the executive officer as to whether to bring that in that uh, bring an action against it. So I just want to clarify that's the first the first threshold is is it substantially related to the practice. <clears throat> All right, so that brings us to you. What created you? We had A B six eighty four and I invited several of the stakeholders here who participated in those discussions uh, and um, came up with the solution of 684. Um, and I bulleted the main things that 684 did. It allowed a new relationship between RDOs and the commissars that was previously prohibited. Um, so now there is a landlord tenant relationship that's allowed between the two. Uh, and within that, within um, its business and professions code 655, it, it sets some parameters on there because the, the goal of uh, the legislature was to still adequately protect the public and so they wanted to put some, they said okay yes this relationship is going to be allowed but we're going to put some parameters on there and some enforcement mechanisms in case something goes wrong. So that was the intent of uh, adding the information into 655, the requirements in there. Um, one thing to point out to you though is with 655 that was what triggers that protection the, and that was the requirements is if you have an RDO and an optometrist. So what we're finding is that 635 will apply in those landlord tenant relationships. But if an RDO contracts or has a relationship with an ophthalmologist, then the ophthalmologist employs or has a relationship with the optometrist, then 655 is not triggered at that point because you don't have a landlord tenant relationship between the two. So that, that's causing some um, confusion and, and potentially an unintended loophole that's happening. Um, because then with 635 not applying, you don't have the mechanisms that were put in place in order to um, help. Excuse me. Yes. I just want to correct something. You said that was an unintended loophole. Um, that was discussed in all negotiations, so people were well aware that they did not Okay, thank you, and I'm sorry, I, I should have clarified to you, I was only brought in the tail end of it, so I don't, I wasn't involved in the, the all the group discussions, there were a lot of them, um, so thank you, Kitty, very much. And the other thing is the way the, the statute is written, uh, the lease provisions also go to relationships between optometrists and optometrists, not just RDOs. Right, okay, thank you. I see you guys don't want to introduce yourself because I think it's great that we have so many stakeholders in the room. Can you? Um, I'm Katie Jones, I'm Rob Passion. I'm the President and CEO of First Sight Vision Systems Inc. I'm Rick Meyer, uh, Regional Vice President for America's Vice President. I'm Lisa Lewis, I'm the I'm from the Attorney General's 
I'm the sweetest I'm Dennis Venus, and I'm the legislative chair for the California Association of Dispensing Opticians. We were formed in 1938, and for the reason that everybody's sitting in the street, we're going to use the founders and started all these laws. As a result of litigation was brought by one of the founders of Modern Day Optics, named Russell Stinson. He was accused in 1938 of practicing optometry without a license. So in 1939, all these laws were written to protect the consumer and to make sure that the qualifications and standards were in the Sorry? I'm here as a resource for anyone because I, I, I do have a plethora of documents that literally go back to the 1930s related to this industry. And sorry to bother everyone because of the noise outside. This is the only microphone we have. So please raise your voice. I know it's not normal, but a little more because of the noise outside. Thank you very much. When you make a comment, thank you. Okay, so I uh, bulleted the increased consumer protection mechanisms that uh, 684 provided. Uh, it gave specific lease requirements, things that have to go into the lease. I gave the board inspection authority, and it also increased citation authority. It moved the RDO program from the medical board to the board of optometry. It replaced one optometrist board member with a dispensing member, and it created you, the dispensing optician committee. Uh, just uh, just yes. on this point here, uh, because I, I came in late and I, I didn't get an introduction at all, but I'm curious to have an understanding of anybody on the RDO committee, or the DOC committee, is a, a registered dispensing optician by definition as opposed to an RSLB or an RCLB. That is to say, is there anybody representing the firms? So it is not yet. We still have one vacancy for that RDO. Okay. Um, so we have, we're trying to still fill that one. But Thank currently, you. we just have, we have a dispensing member, we have a board member, and two public members. And there'll be a total of how many? There will be a total of five members, but we have that one vacancy. And our board member is also a dispenser, an SLD and a CLD. Right, the question is the representation for the firms. I understand. Yeah. yeah, that's still vacant. All right, so here I... Um, Summarized from 3020, that's your statute for your mandates of your responsibilities. Um, you're essentially recommending registration standards and criteria, reviewing disciplinary guidelines after you make disciplinary guidelines. Um, you'll recommend changes, additions to the regulations, uh, and you'll be carrying on implementing, but I think those are the same thing, um, implementing um, any responsibility or duties that the board delegates you to do. Um, so these are these are your your guidelines, and it's pretty broad to allow a lot of um, work to, to be done from the committee. Uh, none of the everything that's done here, any recommendations, go to the board for discussion. Um, if there's anything in there that the board doesn't agree with, they are mandated to explain why they why they don't agree with it um, and respond back to the committee. Um, but the the board does get the final say, but the committee has a lot of room to work. So this goes to the delegated duties from the board. Uh, I just I did put these up here, but these aren't final. The board hasn't adopted its new strategic plan. So what I did is went through the draft strategic plan that they'll look at in August, and I kind of pulled out some of the the, the um, points that they will most likely delegate to the committee. So I just wanted to let you know that these will most likely come to you from them. They might give you more, they might decide to take one of these on, uh, but these are things that, that would relate to the committee. This is what's going to be on the menu for the Right. Uh, well, this and then any everything else on top of that. Uh, so, but first we wanted, uh, the board will approve the strategic plan and then at that time they can delegate what the committee is going to tackle. 
So you had um, under the future plan, you have, um, a, I think, five goals, one licensing, you have examination, you have your laws and regulations. And as you can see, there's a lot of a lot of bullets here, but um, I think you uh, will know by now that there's a lot of work within the um, statutes and the regulations to look at, and so the board recognizes that and wants, wants to make sure that that's on the two future plans and something that we're committed to doing. And then you have enforcement and outreach. So these are just emerging matters that we're finding uh, just as the staff perspective that we wanted to have you keep in mind and, and know that this is, we've only had this program for a year. We are still learning. We are definitely not the experts. There's a lot of stuff we don't know. There's a lot of stuff that Kitty kind of added um, that we, we weren't privy to. And so I think that's why it's so important to have the stakeholders in the room who is part of that and lives this every day so they can come and give their perspective um, and, and help you uh, make any kind of informed decisions that you need in order to protect the consumer. Uh, so with those caveats, um, one of the things that we're finding is that there's the requirement for what we are calling in the database side is there's a valid relationship requirement. <coughs> you have to have the CLD and SLD tied to the RDO location. Where, where that is, is causing a, a few uh, I don't want to say issues, but if, um, you have the individuals, the CLDs and the SLDs, who want to renew their license. So they're trying to stay up with their license, and um, what happens is if that RDO, so it's something that they have no control over, if they haven't renewed their license, if they're delinquent, that individual cannot renew their individual license um, until that RDO is done. Um, also, if the, art, if the CLD or SLD wants to go to another store or say that they're laid off or they just don't want to work there anymore but they want to maintain their license, they're unable to do so because it has to be tied to the RDO. Um, you also have it on the other side where you have RDOs who want to come to California and they want to open up shops but they might not have that person in that location yet. So they, they want to open up but they can't unless they have that person tied to it. So it's causing some delays and so when the committee's looking at processes, maybe look at that process to see if this is still necessary, what is the consumer protection part of this to require this connection? Um, and I don't know if any stakeholders want to add if you're experiencing that at all, the delay. Um, I think our locations are experiencing that delay it's trying to jump over 100 facilities properly by exam. And then as we're um, both managing the property along with the licensing requirements and then bringing up contractors and Macy's and, and Sears and Target, we're bringing them online to uh, the new model. Um, there were lag, lags because of that coupling. Um, there were other issues as well, but I think that's the best description. And I know that the board has been trying to keep up with that lag, but. Um, it does become frustrating when you're when the person wants to be attached to the store, the store wants to be attached to the person, the store's not quite open yet. It's, it, is, it is difficult. And I think what we're trying to do is abide by the law and to Eric that there's a desk this way for it's a suspicious circle. So because we have someone who's assigned whose sole job is to figure all this out. So the chicken and egg theory you know, yes. at first. So I the delay is due to, uh, let's say, the RDO just wants to open it up and they can't because they need um, someone who is a dispenser to be in there and they can't put them together. But we can. So it's good. also, so we bring, we lease the property, and we can't operate without the license. So we're two months out on the license, our pulling maybe is someone from another store, we're bringing someone online, we can't actually provide services. So all of that's buttoned up and in a bow. And if this person's not here by this time or the, the license is the you know the license isn't operating, it's just what would normally happen is we could do all of that two months in advance. You know I mean? What we like to do is have all of that done before we open the door, but sometimes it's a chicken and an egg. And hopefully we're going online it'll be a lot faster. Yeah. So you can do it online. A new online issue though is that Credit card versus check. Because it can be checked by, by online. And we don't, I don't know what other companies.
these um, credit cards for, you don't have a credit card for an individual store. So it's just something to put on the table is we don't have one credit card like back in Ohio that they can use for these purposes for online. They, they cut it all by check and they cut it all by, by bucket where the money's coming from. So it's when we're coming online, if there's a way to say pending receipt of payment or something like that. Well, you should be able to still apply online because it'll go through to us and then we wouldn't be able to process it until we get that payment. So, okay. so what you can do is you um, apply online and then you add it to the cart and it will submit your application online. You still have to submit your paper application, or they still have to submit the paper application, um, and you can attach the check back. And then while we're thinking about the group, that would be great for you. So we might have 25 to 40 stores in the same month. Okay, so these are all, I, I don't want to belabor the committee, these are all things that just kind of seem to be grappling with. Grapple, so. Yeah. So I have a, a technical question. Do you not have um, like floaters who can just go from one store to another? You have to be specifically You're specifically assigned to a store. Assigned, and so and that's part of the thing. You can't just go. Oh, I can't give one person three stores. Slow one mall, and so we'll send them over That'd to the other. And, then I think, <laughs> and there's some like statutes within the regulations about time. I don't, I can't point it out right now, but there is like time frames about working um, for SLEs at a, like, a specific location. So then my, my follow-up is the historic question. What's the origin of this rule that you, you've got to be tied to a location and work for one boss? It almost sounds like the company store type situation. Situation. I have an answer to that. Uh, originally, when these laws were formulated, we wanted mutual accountability. We want, I'm sorry, we didn't want firms to be able to uh, conduct filling prescriptions, dispensing opticians, without the benefit of qualified individuals to connect them. So we recognized them back then that there were cases where there were companies that owned these. And so we had to make them mutually accountable. Just to say, we want to know where you're at, so that you can come over and inspect and make sure that you meet those qualifications. And we want to have an individual that has professional minimum skill sets that can also be held accountable to protect the consumer. But that's why these things are about. So, do you think we're um, uh, 80 years later, or however long it is, more sophisticated, or in terms, certainly in terms of our enforcement and our regulation, and people who are looking out to protect the consumer, that that relationship issue is kind of antiquated? No. I think it's very important. It's intimately connected. I, I don't know how, how can we figure out who these people are, where they're at, so, I, so by trade, I'm a lawyer, and once I have my certificate, I can go work for any law firm, and the bar can discipline me wherever I am if I, I screw up. You can still do that. You can work for any qualified RPO firm. There's no, there's I think no. to your point, and I think it's worth exploring, is there are entities where like a pharmacy has to have a pharmacist to dispense, right? right? But the pharmacy license itself isn't held up by the coupling of the two. There is a law on the books, and I'm, I'm speaking a little bit out of turn here because you might know it's better, but you, the pharmacy can't operate without a licensed pharmacist. So if we know we can't operate without a licensed dispenser on property, why do they have to couple them? I think it's I think there might be an inter meaning we can't even register our site unless they're coupled, but yet we know by law we can't operate without it. So why do you know in the, in the registration process why can't we you know register and then identify the person moving forward and then in any enforcement or citing action you walk on and make sure that we have the person there. So I think there's a discussion that to your, to your point that is worth having because at some point it's a, it's a matter of paperwork that's really backed up really truly by the enforcement process, not, you don't have to, when I mean, you're enforcing by desk at that point. The, so back, 
in response is do you agree that the the pharmacy analogy is apt here? Well, I, no, not per se, because when you fill out the original RDO application, that's the firm, that's the business. But we don't want a business to start operating unless we verify that they have somebody there. And that's the, the only company I'm aware of is that the requirement that says you have to have an actual licensed individual as opposed to just running freely. And when we look at the terms and conditions under Title 16. Uh, Actually, Dennis, I'm, gonna, I'm sorry, I'm gonna jump in here just because the purpose right now is not to come up with the solutions, just to have, just have that this is an issue and if it's something that the committee thinks is worth right. further discussions, then we can put that on the priority list because there's a lot of matters I think that we're gonna have to tackle. So if we can just agree that this is a discussion that we need to have, um, and then we can move on. Right. I have what I have noted for when we we'll get down to seven, but I think the committee will probably tackle that. The solution? Not the solution, oh, okay. just the topic of the discussion. Yes. yes. I thank you very much for allowing me to do that. I think Anna got something. Um, I just kind of wanted to get clarification too, because I understand the CLD and the SLD is to RDL. Um, for those who end up going to the private sector, um, how would they be able to renew their licensing if it's not within uh, an RDO? So an example of a private sector as a the private optometrist. So then they are no longer considered under the, the jurisdiction of that license. They become what, uh, essentially an optometric assistant and they're acting under the optometrist license. So because I, I only know that there's a lot of opticians who end up going to the center and they go back and forth. Yes. Um, and for them to keep that licensing, would they be able to even renew it? So no, and that's actually another matter that we're finding because that's very common for SLDs or CLDs to go into um, a store and work there for a while and then they decide they want to go and work for an optometrist. Um, so there, there's causing conflict there because they can't renew their CLD and SLD, and really they shouldn't even be telling, saying, or advertising that they are an, a, a dispenser or an optician because they are an optometric assistant at that point. Um, and they're doing different things. They act, optometric assistants have a different scope than what a, a dispenser has. Um, and I think that there's a, just a lot of confusion as to what you can do. A lot of people think that it's the same scope and that your dispensing registration allows you to do the exact same thing as the optometrist assistant and it vice versa and that's not the case. So I think that's a lot of the outreach and maybe a, another issue for the um, committee to look at is if that is really necessary to protect the consumer, if there's a better way to do that, but that's for the committee and stakeholders to discuss. Does the board require um, some sort of license or registration for optometric assistants? No, optometric assistants are not regulated. Um, there is a statute um, that says what they can do because it also falls under optometric assistance and then the assistance for the ophthalmologist. Um, it says what they can do under the supervision of that licensee. But, but I could go and be one today. An optometric assistant? Yeah. Yeah. And then we'll, we'll meet you and you understand the state of practice and what an assistant does in comparison to a dispenser. And they're quite different. So I, we can go over that too and, and look at the different terms. Okay, then you have, um, that's the balance relationship. You have the online dispensers. Uh, I touched on it before. You have uh, allowing online for contacts, but we don't have anything allowing online for spectacles. So when you look at these requirements, just um, kind of try to think of why why that's necessary. Is that um, realistic in, in the times of technology and where everybody wants to do everything online? Is there a way to adequately protect the consumer and allow this uh, business model? I think that's a conversation for the community to have. Um, also, in we, uh, one thing that we do get, we get calls from dispensers who want to uh, just open up their own shop in California and just dispense lenses on Facebook, or and they want to have just an online business and they can't do that. 
Uh, so maybe the committee should look at it. Is it is that the proper way to protect the consumer? Is to completely prohibit uh, online dispensing, or is there another way to still serve that the consumer to to give them the same protections that they would with this? Um, I also touched on uh, the severe outreach that we need. We need a huge outreach effort to the profession. We have started to reach out to the corporations. Uh, what we found is when we got the population from the, the medical board, we got roughly 4,500 licensees and only maybe 500 email addresses. Uh, and those email addresses weren't always current. We had a lot of the addresses of record weren't current. Um, what we find is if on the renewal they indicate on the box that they changed their address on the on the coupon that when they sent to staff, that's up to staff to then go in and change. And if it's not changed, their address of record is never updated. So when we're trying to communicate with them, they're not getting the information from us. So uh, we really uh, felt it when we said we were recruiting for the Dispensing Optician Committee. Uh, the only thing that we had was the address of record for the registrations. Um, I would say about 20% of them came back because the address of records weren't correct. Um, and so I think that's a huge uh, issue that we're having that I think with now putting the applications online, they can go online and update their address of record. Uh, every time we talk to a dispenser, we receive an application because that uh, email address is not part of the application itself. So we're not collecting it at any point. And so now staff is trained that whenever we talk to them, we want to capture that email because that's a really quick way for us to get information to them. We're also talking to lots of the corporations and, and also partner with them to get the word out to their individuals as well. So we're trying to work on it, but there's just a huge uh, confusion as far as what the registration does, who we are, who licenses them, what's the difference between their license here and their certification with the ABO. Um, and so I think that there's a lot of work for us to do in order to help educate the profession. Just got to jump on since I noticed you put the word severe on the community really need attention right yeah. away. And maybe when we get to items up, we can discuss a little bit. Is there going to be some, some pretty quick revenue? Yeah, and one thing too that we're, and I, I say severe because it, it's pretty severe when we look at. The population um, right now, I think about a third of the SLD registrations are delinquent. Uh, that's a pretty high um, population that's delinquent. I don't think it's intentional. I just think they don't know that they go to us to renew it. They think that they've renewed it through through the ABO, their certification the whole time. What's the issue? And we get calls and they're very unhappy because they're finding out that their license is not current and they thought they were doing it this whole time. Um, so I think it's definitely something that we have to tackle. Jessica, does the APO have any information on their site about, you know, per, per state, here's what you have to do. You've got to register with us, and then you also have to go to this board to... That I don't know. Do you? Mm -hmm. I have a date on that. The American Board of Optician Area has been in this for many, many years. And remember, they are applicants from all of the states. So they will, um, we're not required as opticians to keep up our certification if we don't want to in California. But in the other states, they are required. So we're going to monitor them a little bit more. The only thing they're monitoring is if you are continuing your continuing education credits. That's all they're doing. And yes, they do have current information like addresses and the certification number. But as far as licensing, they don't get into a state, especially like California, if we're not. A license there, we're not a license there. So would it? So it seems like as a possible solution is to get make that license a a license, a license and then have them push on that out from there and also. That's something we can think about. So I touched already on the low passing rates for the national exams and potential causes for that low passage rate. Uh, we did tell the legislature that would be something that we would look into to find out this, what's causing that and then any recommendations to improve that if we feel that that needs to be improved. Uh, another thing that we might want to look at is partnering with the prison system um, because what we're finding is that a lot of these um, these 
uh, individuals come with with convictions, and they've had some of them several convictions on their record, but they are learning this trade in prison to get back into the workforce, which is a positive thing. But they think that that registration is it's going to be an automatic thing as soon as they apply. And um, since we're a consumer protection agency, we still have to look at every case to see if you have a history of manslaughter, we might not want you to be um, issuing or fitting and adjusting if you have, um, I can think of other awful examples, but I won't. It's just, it's not a guarantee that if they are um, learning this in, in prison, they're not guaranteed that. I think that's causing some conflict there. Um, I do know that it's definitely in the public view as a positive thing. It was on KCRA in Sacramento um, a few months ago, a special on um, the prison to work system. And they had an optician there who was who had a, a really rough past and um, was everybody was was proud of him for what he was able to become through this learning this trade in prison. Um, so, but that's also one thing to keep in mind is when you're putting the in, when you're thinking of adding any kind of requirements on it um, or education requirements, continuing education, that's the kind of population that you're also having to deal with. So when you look at that, like Kurt had said, the minimum standards in order to enter the population, um, just keep that in mind that you also have that subset of individuals who will already come out right out the gate um, with little to no education um, and they're learning this trade. Yeah. There's quite a lot of legislation that curtails an employer's ability to look at their criminal past. So, a growing number of healthcare professionals are depending on their licensing entity to clear some of that information. Hospitals are limited, believe it or not, whether they can determine, for example, if someone has an abuse case before they bring them onto a night shift on their own. Uh, because the legislature uh, has a policy and wants to make sure that rehabilitation. Is achieved at its high at its higher level. Sorry, I'm not speaking up loud enough. So, I, for uh, the employer community, it's critical that our licensing entities have the ability to uh, clearly and definitively look at all of these. So, I, I, I just argue that's a great recommendation that we need to make sure that you all have the ability to make to ensure that the the crime is uh, and the conviction and the rehabilitation is appropriate. And uh, an important note for that, thank you, Pat, is um, employers don't have the same clearances as far as what we see on the record. So em employers might not see as much as we can see um, for their conviction history. We have, because we see all, we see the expunged, we see the dismissed, we see all of them dating back for their entire um, life. So we, we get the records where employers might not get the records. So to Pat's point, the employers are really depending on them to get this license, the, the individuals depending on this license, we see convictions that employers don't see. Uh, so those are all things that we look at. Uh, the regulations, they are they are few and, and what is there is super thin. Um, and so I think that we have, we need to, to do a better job of, of creating regulations and um, just we need to get all of our applications in there. Uh, we need to define what these terms are. Uh, there's several, what, what is there I think needs to be updated. Uh, so there's a lot of work there. Um, I mentioned the application. So with that, I mean, I'd like to open it up to anyone else who wants to add issues for the committee of emerging matters. Um, so that's it for me, though. Do we have any problems with that? Yeah. Um, I kind of going back to the private sector, just because I get a lot of input from the clinicians and from, oh. um, Going back to the private sector, um, just because I do interact with a lot of patients, as well as um, my employees, who, for example, um, like I mentioned earlier, if they are licensed opticians, um, and they, for example, go to a private sector, and their license is no longer there, um, what happens in terms of, um, um, a lot of offices are having issues in terms of finding licensed 
opticians or those who have the skills. So that way the patients or our consumers um, feel as though those who are dispensing to them are knowledgeable. And right now there's nothing really in place for the private optometry office, not to say that it's a requirement for someone to have the licensing to work under a doctor. However, what if someone does want to obtain that licensing so that way they feel that they're competent enough to dispense and understand what ANSI standards are? Um, because that is really important. And a lot of offices are suffering primarily because there's not enough training there. And then in terms of the patient's aspect, they also feel as though, well, does this individual who's an optometric assistant know what it is to be an optician? It's two very different roles. And I think that's something maybe we want to kind of go into because as uh, more private optometry office are starting to cut the edge and create a lab, that's something that I think um, would be really important for the consumers. I also would like to talk do opticians make the lenses in the labs? They're the ones who usually do the final inspections um, to make sure that it's properly um, meeting the ANSI standards, as well as when we're dispensing to a patient to make sure they understand how to properly use it. Optometric assistants, they're the, the ones who typically do more of the preliminary testing, it's kind of like a medical assistant. Right, but like in terms of grinding the glass or however they make the lens. Who, who, who does that? I have an answer to that. Most of that's done by laboratories and those are mostly technicians that are trained to do different functions. That's why it's so important that all those glasses that are manufactured in whatever lab are ultimately inspected before they're delivered to a patient by somebody who has met minimum concept. As far as working in the employee of optometrist, that's under the direct supervision. That's, that's a different process. Right. So I also like to open up to the stakeholders. I thought it was really important since this is a program that's brand new to us, but not so much to the stakeholders. So if there's any processes or issues that they're seeing, I'd like them to share with the committee as well with as the main reason why I invited them here to provide that information uh, and I, I, I appreciate the invitation to speak on this and it's timely on this topic now because the distinction between an RSOP, someone who has met minimum competencies in an RDO location to fill any doctor's prescription as opposed to those employees who work for the firms of an optometrist and are only allowed to fill those prescriptions under the direct supervision and responsibility of that doctor. What we see frequently is people, that is those who have may or may not have held an RSLB in an RDO environment, that are holding themselves out as RSLBs and filling anyone else's prescription. And we believe that's a a huge potential for for consumers to be harmed because we don't have the consumers of competencies. So we we feel like that there's a lot of that going on. That optometrists routinely are advertising that they have opticians, which is in my opinion directly misleading the public. And I can't imagine for what purpose other than an economic benefit. So those laws are already on the books, but they haven't been enforced vigorously for over a decade. And Dennis, I, I do want, because I don't think we are only going to have a hand out on um, Pito's proposed, or I'm sorry, <coughs> your, your position statement. It's our abbreviated position summary. Uh, Related to uh, the way we understand the profession and, and going forward, we felt it would be helpful for this group to start understanding some of the mechanisms that are required here. And I think that speaks to it. I, 
I don't know that for sure. I mean, I can't remember. I don't know for sure the numbers. I think it's roughly 21 regulate them, but I, I could be wrong. Yes. There's, there are 21 states that are, uh, you have to have a license in those states to practice in other conditions. There's 21 states, and those are recognized by the American Board of Optician. Okay. So then all the rest of the states, they don't have any requirements. So for the other 29, is there a difference in quality or the amount of what is the protection of the lines? Or depends on the states. Have an issue. Yeah, depends on the state. All of the states. Just thinking of regulation of the parties and all the relationship versus the union. Yeah. Are any other stakeholders that have cast us out? But um, any issues with processes or any. Um, statutes that you feel should be looked at, anything? Yeah. This is only for the RPO program, not looking at the RPO program. Correct, yeah, this is limited to the purview of the of the committee, so they're under for the RDO program. But you're welcome to come to the August 4th and 5th board meeting and, and jump in there, too. Any? Yes. I didn't see your PowerPoint on the website. It is up there. That's actually what I'm on right now. So, here I'll go. So, see it says optometry cd.gov, and it's under... Slowly. That's what I was just in. So, there's a link. Uh, to the, the meeting here, right here. So it says agenda and the materials. Yeah. So you pull that up, and then you have here an agenda with all the links to the materials. So mine was this one, number three, and yeah. that's the, the presentation. Mm -hmm. So uh, do we have time to go into agenda number four? I would respectfully suggest at this point, I think we better have taken a break. I can't hear you. I respectfully suggest for this committee would consider taking a break and an announcement of the plan to have financial. But we can have one. Oh, yeah. So we'll take like a 10 minute break and that would be like this. So if you want to take a little bit of a break at this point. I have one time back. So we we have time for the ADT. Okay. So we take a, a minute break and then start up. to understand since, since this committee is new to our office as well. And I am the contact person also for our office when there's questions about um, enforcement. I'm, so, I'm sorry, I just want to provide one clarification. When she said it's new to the ADG's office, it's new to that side, so I don't want anybody thinking that when it was over at medical board, we didn't involve the ADG's office. They did. Um, it was over a different division, and now um, they're under uh, the board, we're under a what they have as a licensing division. So, just to clarify. Thank, thank you, because there are 5,000 attorneys, and I think our office needs 14 of us in licensing. <laughs> <laughs> I do mean just the licensing section. Okay, so an overview I just wanted to go over generally the board's purpose and mission and their responsibilities. Then there's the agency responsibilities, which are the staff, that's Jessica and, and all of her staff members. And there are also the DOC responsibilities. And as part of, part of your responsibilities, uh, there's certain tools that are at your disposal to help regulate the practice. And I will be going over those tools as they relate to enforcement. 
Um, so as a little bit of a background, the State Board of Optometry was created in 1937, and that was to safeguard public health, safety, and welfare. And that's made up of 11 board members, and as of 2016, one of those professional members must be registered as a dispensing optician, spectacle lens dispenser, or contact lens dispenser in good standing with the board. And that is a review. The dispensing optician committee that was created is required to have five members, and one of those must be a, a member of the board, one must be an SLD or CLD, one must be an RDO, which I understand is, is the vacant position, and two public members. So the board's responsibilities are to institute disciplinary actions. Some of the board's responsibilities are to institute disciplinary actions for violations of law and regulations governing the practice of optometry. And the licensing laws were created in order to uh, protect the public from scrupulous, negligent, incompetent practitioners. So licensing laws are intended not just to um, discipline harm done, but to prevent the potential for harm. And for the board to follow through with their responsibilities, there are certain things that they do delegate to the agency or to the board staff. And that's the enforcement program. So there are about three things, three major things that the enforcement program does. They can file accusations. That's where there's a document that's filed, our, our office files that document, and it's based on egregious conduct where the board is seeking to revoke or suspend or place that licensee on, or registrant on probation because of their conduct. Um, the other is a petition to revoke probation. These are licensees that are have already gone through a disciplinary process, they are now placed on probation, and they still violate either the terms of probation or some other terms that are regulated in practice. The board then would request that a petition to revoke probation be filed and further disciplinary action be taken. There is a um, third manner of regulating the profession being statement of issues. Yes. Um, is there like a lesser, like can we do citations and fines and that yes. sort of thing? Or yes. Um, the, the EO has the ability to issue citations, and if those citations are appealed, then they would come to the Attorney General's office to pursue that appeal. But there are citations, I believe there's also letters of uh, ed educational letters, and d does the board do letters of reprimand? I think we have an authority, I have to double check on that, and I know we have our contest, I'm not, I have to double check on our oh, okay. Um, so there, there definitely are lesser methods of discipline. Uh, and then a statement of issues. That's when a licensee is seeking license and the board initially denies that application because they are either not qualified or they have a criminal conviction or in some other manner um, it renders that person unfit for the practice that they are applying for. And these are just the most frequently used tools uh, once the cases get to the Attorney General's office. So the, the question I think becomes how your role fits into the board and the agency responsibilities, and it's a very critical one. Um, part of your responsibilities under the Business and Professions Code is to review the disciplinary guidelines relating to registered dispensing opticians and non-resident contact lens sellers, etc. There currently are no, no disciplinary guidelines. Um, so what are they? They're, they're critical. They are uh, the terms of probation. 
So if a licensee is placed on probation, you need to know what the terms of those that probation is going to be. Without disciplinary guidelines, we don't really have a set rule of what terms of probation would be applicable in um, situations where discipline is being taken. And like I said, your current regulations do not make any reference to the disciplinary guidelines because there aren't any. So we need you to please create some. Because they're used in just about every single stage of enforcement. <coughs> they're used in settlement discussions. Um, when cases have already been filed with an accusation, frequently we can settle the cases out of, out of court because we can offer some probation terms that would continue to provide safety to the, pub, to the public, to the consumer, and also provide board oversight over this practitioner. Without the disciplinary guidelines, those cases can be reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis, but it becomes in increasingly difficult to make sure that there are no underground regulations being enforced. Underground regulations are something that right now the, um, the, the board is at risk of because there are no regulations regulating this area of practice. That's when the board has to make decisions of how to um, enforce a discipline, and they might start enforcing for every case the same way for every single case. That now becomes an underground regulation because it's essentially a law that the board is abiding by, except it's not written anywhere, and nobody has notice of it. So the disciplinary guidelines are are very important to ensuring that the board maintains proper functioning when it comes to enforcement. The administrative law judges who make the decisions in these cases, they rely on the disciplinary guidelines. So they might hear a case, they might have their opinions, but at the end of the day, if they determine that somebody needs to be revoked, um, it's based on what's going to be contained, the factors in the disciplinary guidelines. If they determine someone needs to be placed on probation, based on the information that they have heard in trial, they're going to pair that up with what protections are going to be in the disciplinary guidelines that would be applicable to that particular individual. So um, they are used in evidentiary hearings as well. And once an evidentiary hearing is completed and the decision goes to the board for adoption, the board is now looking at the disciplinary guidelines to make sure that the judge applied them correctly to the facts. So it, it, they are used in every stage of enforcement. I also mentioned that they're used in the petitions to revoke probation, um, because if there's a violation of probation, the agency and the board is going to look at the probation terms that were violated, the nature of those terms, um, and whether violation of those terms demonstrates unfitness for practice. They are used in post-hearing matters. So once a license is revoked, the um, former licensee can come before the board and seek to have their license reinstated. If their license is reinstated, it sometimes is placed on probation, and the board now has to look at the disciplinary guidelines for some guidance as to what probation terms, if any, would make this a safe practitioner if they're provided their license back. They're also looked at in modification of penalty and early termination. So these are the people that are on probation currently, and they are seeking to reduce certain terms of their probation, or either the length of it or the nature of the term. And again, this is something that they go before the board to do, and the board has to look at those terms to determine if without that term, the rest of the terms of probation would still keep the public safe as a result of what this practitioner has done in the past. The second tool that is at this committee's disposal is uh, to create regulations. And in in general, like regulations, implement, interpret, or make, oops, sorry, I flipped my page, I didn't click yours. 
they implement, interpret, or make specific the statutes of the agency. So the, the question is, how do you know which statutes may need regulations? There are generally three types of statutes. There's the self-executing statute. The statute itself is so specific, it doesn't need any explanation or implementation. An example being, if you have a statute that says the annual licensing fee is 500, that's pretty specific. You know, that's the licensing fee. But there's also statutes that might try to give a little bit of um, discretion to the board. So the statute might say the annual licensing fee can't be more than 500. Well, now you need a regulation to put into place as to what that licensing fee is going to be. So without a regulation, that statute really has um, no teeth to it. There's not much that can be done. And then there's the statutes that always seem to get us in some trouble, which is they're susceptible to interpretation. Um, they can be enforced without a regulation, but it's helpful to have a regulation to um, explain that statute. One example is there shall be adequate space between hospital beds. So yes, that statute can be can be enforced on a case by case basis, depending on the type of hospital and kind of care being provided. But it would also be very helpful if that statute or if a regulation were to define what adequate would mean. So these are the statutes that can be interpreted um, different ways. And if there are statutes that you come across that think really should have one interpretation. Those are the statutes you, you might want to look at to uh, regulate it in the specific way you think meets the needs of this particular industry. Another way, another tool you have to regulate safe practice is by statute. The, the statutes currently that we have for um, the optician industry are, are deficient. Um, and they're deficient because they don't really provide an ability to enforce. In not providing an ability to enforce, they're also not educating the industry of what the rules and regulations are that apply to them. So it's really a matter of fairness and notice to everybody involved of what can be regulated and what you should and should not do. Um, some, of the, some of the conduct that should be regulated um, and is regulated really across the board and other boards are not contained in the current um, statute. One of them is general unprofessional conduct. This one's a big one, especially right now with this being um, a new, kind of this new creation that we're all embarking on. Unprofessional conduct is really just what it says. It's anything that can be deemed unprofessional to the industry. And that may be coming up more and more as the industry booms and progresses. We might start seeing different things that impact um, consumer protection. And so unprofessional conduct would be a way for the board to regulate certain um, activities that might come up um, that are unique to the industry. Yes, hi. I, I have a question. Does the unprofessional conduct go to professionals who are licensed under uh, statutes as opposed to registrants? And we're not talking about licensed professionals here. The registration process is different. And I use that as an example of what some of the things might be to look at that are important to uh, maintaining proper professionalism in the industry, even if it's not guys under the term or it's not termed in professional conduct. Um, and those are the examples I'm providing, is that these are used to regulate uh, licensed professionals, but they might in some way translate in various forms to this industry that um, this committee might find needs to be regulated. Um, other examples being if there's dishonest or deceitful acts in the individual's past or maybe in um, the type of criminal history that they have. Um, being for the board to be able to enforce cooperation with orders or citations um, 
unlawful or dangerous use of alcohol or drugs, um, and aiding and abetting unlicensed activity. So these were just some bullet points that you could think about whether they would affect the industry. I'm sorry, good question. For aiding and abetting unlicensed activity as a registered or licensed practitioner, does that mean like, what does that mean? I don't know. And and it's more of questions of if you see that in the industry, if that's something that might require regulation, and it might not. Uh, but like what's in other separate Because before you guys took over, a lot of competitions that I understood were just pay the fee to the medical board and neglect the ABO. You would have to pay their annual. You know, every three years we do an ABO, and they would just keep it, and then they would go kind of unlawful and dispensing and money. Um, the reason why you keep your certification up is if you are keeping up with continuing education credits, and in California we're not required to do that. But that's the thing I'm So would that pertain to well, the license? Oh, well, again, I. I couldn't identify to what that point is, but you can still be licensed in California without a community certification. That's the way it stands right now. And this is all just food, food for thought of if, if you find ways that they might fit into this industry. Right now, I believe the only um, <coughs> violations are for um, in incompetence, gross negligence and similar similar yeah. negligent acts. Uh, so it, it, it is somewhat limited. There's also confusing language. Um, again, going off of memory, there is the statutes are set out as general provisions, which seem to apply to RDOs and SLD, CLD. And then it gets more specific to statutes that apply to CLDs and statutes that apply to SLDs. And they are not the same. Some statutes, um, for example, we get a lot of criminal convictions. So the SLD and CLD require felony convictions, but the general provisions, which seem to encompass everybody, requires only convictions substantially related. So it doesn't specify whether it's a felony or a misdemeanor. So there's a lot of confusion, and we tend to have to piggyback on a bunch of statutes in order to get to, P.S., you committed a crime, and <laughs> this is a violation. So the, there's quite a bit of confusion, some overlap, some just complete dissonance of the statutes really working together. Um, and then definitions. I think we already talked about direct responsibility. What, we don't know what that means as far as enforcement goes. Um, what, what is a direct, a, someone who's directly responsible for somebody else? What is an assistant? What does direct supervision mean? Is that different from direct responsibility? What is accessible meaning? Um, so there, we might come across terms that make you wonder, what does this mean? And those, it's going to make us wonder the same thing at the Attorney General's office. And those are those things that we, we might want regulations to help us understand, to be able to better enforce, and so that the industry knows what um, their mandates are. There's also a very limited basis for denial of application. It, it goes hand in hand with also the enforcement aspect. Some um, other things to think about. There are there are ways to circumvent enforcement actions to prevent discipline, paperwork, accusations being filed. And one example is with the um, Board of Registered Nursing and their code section is 2751, where they provide the ability to a licensee to just surrender their license based on a mental or physical condition that they might have, um, which renders them unsafe to practice. So there's no accusation filed, there's no wrongful conduct alleged, it's just that they're saying, I have a mental or physical condition that's preventing me from being able to practice, I'm surrendering my license. And that license is subject to reinstatement after um, one year in the BRN code, the Registered Nursing Code. Um, you might also want to consider um, 
statutes or regulations that provide derivative jurisdiction. So if a licensee is disciplined because they are associated with one RDO and they are disciplined there, do you want that um, licensee to not be able to be on any other uh, licenses? Or do you want all of his licenses to be able to be um, disciplined as a result of uh, him, him or her being disciplined under one license, if they have multiple licenses? So that's some things a lot of the boards have as well. We, when there are multiple licenses an individual can have, to have derivative jurisdiction where all of their licenses can be impacted. Okay. Any questions or comments? I'll try to answer That's great. Okay. Any questions? Any public? Thank you. Okay, so we're now going to move on to um, agenda item number five. And that's what we have now. We have more comments. the computer, computer, what you weren't before? Yeah. Go, go ahead. Yeah. So committee members, uh, Natalie is from DCA's Ledge Reg uh, Division. Uh, I asked her here to kind of to give an overview of the process because as you have heard, there's a lot of work to be done both by statute and by regulation. Uh, so I wanted her to provide a little training of what that process is, because it's not, um, okay, you make the recommendation, it goes to the board, the board says, yes, go for it, and then we're off and running. There's processes for each side of it, and so I wanted um, you guys to have that education up front so you know what to expect and the proper timelines to follow. Oh, and members, just to also let you know, too, um, Natalie updated it last night at um, a little after 11. So there's a couple things that might be a, a little different, and so it's not also matching with what's, on, what's okay. online, but we'll take it and update it. Yes, yeah, save a little minor changes. Um, so, like, so hi, my name is Natalie Martin Rojas. Like Jessica said, um, I am the legislative analyst that is assigned to the Board of Optometry. Um, I'm with the Division of Legislative and Regulatory Review from the Department of consumer affairs and basically my role as um, the analyst as assigned to the board is to um, review the um, legislation and the regulations that are related to the optometry board. So basically I look at them for like content, um, I look at them to make sure that they make sense, you know, and, and also um, as a part of um, the department as an, as an entity of the administration, I also write analyses um, for the uh, director and, for, and uh, to the governor. So um, just so you guys can kind of understand what my role is. In terms of how um, you know, our office works with the, um, with the board is that we kind of provide a lot of just uh, assistance to the board. The board can make you know, its own uh, policy positions, they can run their own bills, that kind of thing. But if there's any questions that you guys have on like, you know, is there, you know, you know, where is this in the process? Or, you know, like, have, you know, have you heard from any other stakeholders that have contacted you separately? You know, um, strategy, that kind of thing. Um, you know, that's that's what, kind of what we're there for. So we're there as like a, a you know, informational resource as opposed to like an oversight entity in terms of legislation and regulation. So, um, like Jessica said, this is the legislation and regulation training. Um, you know, we're going to discuss the, determine the best course of action because these are the two ways where basically you can get where you derive your um, your authority, uh, and so they're and so they're different. Um, so we'll kind of go over how they're different. We'll define some common terms. Um, 
like I said, go over the, go over the legislative process and, and the regulatory process, and then also talk about setting up an internal process. So um, first, you know, we have a regulation. So a regulation, so one of the pros of the regulation is that, um, you know, you guys have been hearing a lot about regulations, is um, that basically this is something that's board driven. So the board, you know, makes the language, they, you know, the, they go through a, you know, a very transparent process, but it's very, you know, board directed. Um, you know, the cons to that is that you, that you need special statutory authority to go and make those regulations. You can't just be like, oh, I want to do this. You know, you actually need, um, you know, the legislature needs to give you that authority to go and do that. Um, and also, the, le the regulatory process takes quite a while. It can take a year to a year and a half to actually complete. Um, whereas legislation can be done very quickly. It can be done, the legislative session is officially about nine months. Um, if you guys are sponsoring legislation, it, you know, that usually starts a little bit prior to that, so it's only right around like the 10 or 11 month mark, just so you can prepare your language and get it all um, worked out. And so, and then it's introduced. And so, um, you know, like I said, the, you know, the pro is that it goes and, you know, it's, it uh, is done very, very quickly. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, you have, there's a lot of people, you know, giving their input. And you have stakeholders and a lot of folks who are sitting here, but also the members. So, you know, you have to have a member carry your bill. And if the member says, hey, I'm not really comfortable with this, you know, I'm really concerned about this, you know, and they, I, you know, I'll carry this bill, but I want to do X, Y, Z changes, and they're free to do that. So, um, so you know, you, you might, you know, you just don't have a lot of control over the final, final language that gets passed. Which is yes. the yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. And so, like, and like I said, you know, you have to find an author. So, whereas regulation, like I said, you know, it's the, you know, the board goes and says we're going to do it. Whereas legislation, you have to go find some find a, a legislative member to carry it for you. So, the cast of characters for the legislative process. Um, we have the we have legislators, you know, the um, assembly members and senators, um, the legislative staff, and those. And when you do do anything with um, you know with legislation, those are pretty much the people that um, your that your staff and the board is going to be communicating with about those those pieces of legislation. Um, the governor's administration, so that can include the governor's office, but also the department, because we're technically under the governor's administration. Um, constitutional officers, so depending on the content of the um, uh, you know, of the bills, you know, other constitutional offices may weigh in. You know, you have, you know, the attorney general, um, or you know, uh, the, uh, the you know, the secretary of state, or the insurance commissioner. You know, all, any of those other constitutional officers can weigh in on that bill. Um, independent boards. So, for example, for um, you know, one of the other boards, um, or one of the other bureaus under DC is the um, Bureau of Automotive Repair, and they. Do a lot of stuff you know, with the emission standards, and so, so a lot of times the, the Air Resources Board, which is not under DCA, weighs in on that. So that kind, of, so that kind of thing, where you know other independent boards weigh in on, on that legislation um, or regulation, and then of course the stakeholders and interest groups. So um, a lot of those are your associations. Um, sometimes businesses, like larger businesses, will weigh in on that um, on your um, on your regulations and your legislation. Um, so first. The major terms for uh, legislation. The first one is the House of Origin, which is also called the First House. And basically, what that means is that um, that's the house that the bill is introduced in. So the bill is basically a piece of legislation. Um, and so, you know, that, so that's so it, we'll get into a bit. That's is sorry. The second house. That is the other house that that it was you know, that it wasn't introduced. And so, if it's an assembly bill, the second house would be sent. If it's a Senate bill, then the second. Of the assembly. The author, the author is um, the assembly member or the, or, the, or the senator. So it's the legislative member, um, and that is you know that that's who will be carrying your bill. The sponsor is someone different. The sponsor is could be you guys if you guys came up with the language of the bill. It could be you know um, one of the stakeholders. You know if they're sponsoring the bill, then they can go up the floor of legislation and find someone to carry it, and they're the sponsor of the bill. Um, and something that's really important to note about sponsorship is that this is also the, you know, the personal organization who's directing the language that's actually in the bill. So if someone is sponsoring a bill and you guys have problems with it or you guys think that you guys have technical concerns or anything like that, you know, you basically you can't just say, well, I don't like that and you should change it and expect those changes to happen. 
the sponsor needs to agree with you that they, you know, that, that they want those changes to happen as well. Um, so that's just something, just to about sponsorship. Um, enroll means that the, um, the bill has passed through both houses um, and, uh, and, the, and is getting ready to be signed by the governor. Um, chapter means that it has been signed by the governor. So after it's signed, it gets a chapter number and it's you know, part of the statute. So you know, for this year, it'll be 2017. So the legislative process. Um, you know, we have, so this is just like a general diagram that we have. We'll be filling in as we go along. First, so first up is the legislative idea. So a lot of legislation can come from um, you know, various different places. It can come from some stakeholders. It can come from the governor. You know, the governor can say, hey, I have an idea. Let's do this. Um, it can come from one of the departments. Um, one of the boards, or you know, even um, a citizen, you know, um, who goes to the legislator and says, "Hey, there's a problem. I really want to address it." And so the legislator says, "Yes, this is a problem in my district. I'm going to move this forward." Um, so then they come up with this, uh, with this. Okay. <laughs> they go. They, they come up with you know with some language and they introduce it. So they draft this bill and they, and they send it to the legislative council, and the legislative council looks it over and um, and assigns it a number and all that. And so, but when a bill is introduced, it can be touched for 30 days. So it just kind of sits there, so people can have time to review it and see all of that. Um, and so this kind of this process generally happens in like the December to February timeline. Um, so because so you have to do, because it has to happen before. The, uh, the, lead, the first house deadline, introduction deadline. And also another thing is, you know, is, you know what would happen if you, know, you have an idea, it's still trying to be fleshed out, you don't have language, but you're almost there, and you're like, ah, you know, what do I do? You know, you have an author who's like, agreed to it, and said, yes, I'm gonna carry the bill, but you know, you're, not, you're not quite there yet. Um, that's, that's basically when, when the author might do something called introducing a spot bill. Which means that they'll go and they'll put in a bill that, like, probably you know has something related to do you know with optometry, and they'll they'll change like she to they, you know. So, so so like innocuous change that basically says that there's something that's going to be amended in this code section, you know, TBD. Um, it's usually not uh, you know anything um, controversial, and so usually that's amended later after the deadline. That's basically just to make sure that there's something. So um, the first thing is the policy committee, and so this is really a, this is kind of the first point, at least in the first house, where you guys really get to weigh in. So um, as an advisory committee, you guys will work with the board to give your opinions on the legislation that affects, um, you know, on our U.S. politicians and all that. And so um, what happens in the policy committee is that this, it, 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 when it gets assigned to, just generally the, the business and professions committee, and um, it gets assigned to them, gets assigned to a consultant who's kind of like me, but in the committee, and they review the bill and they you know, look for like any sort of like you know pitfalls or you know policy issues and stuff like that. And so one of the you know ways that they kind of are made aware of some certain issues is by you guys. Is by you guys contacting them, writing a letter, taking a position, or even just calling up and saying, "Hey, you know what? We don't have a position yet, but we have some concerns." You know, just to make them aware that there's something happening. You know, or maybe you guys like it and think this is like awesome. This is so great. We love it in its current form. And so you want to go and you know talk to the calls for me and say, "You know what? We love it. This is great. We hope you guys support it." Um, and so that happens in both houses. It's usually the first committee that's that it's uh, referred to after it gets uh, introduced and assigned number, um, and then the second house, you know, it, it just gets passed through the desk. And then this is the appropriations committee. So then, if it has a fiscal cost to it, then it it gets referred to the appropriations committee. If it does not have fiscal cost assigned to it, then it just skips this entirely. Um, and so basically the appropriations committee will look for it for a fiscal impact. They won't analyze the policy part. So if you have a policy issue, make sure you get that done in the policy hearing. Um, because if you have a fiscal issue, this is where you, where you go and you say, hey, this is a problem, or hey, you know, this is, you know, it might cost a lot, but this is why we think it's a really, really good idea, and this is why we think you should pass it. 
and then there's the four considerations. So um, the four, for the House of Origin, that usually goes through pretty smoothly. Um, you know, if, if, it, if it makes it to the first house, you're, you know, you're well on your way. However, in the second house, that's where things can get a little tricky sometimes because when you get to the second house, that is your last step before it hits the governor's desk. It is, you know, for consideration. So when people, so when it hits the second house and for a third reading, they're like, oh my gosh, like, you know, this is, you know, do we really want to do this? You know, and so they really, so then sometimes they're, you know, they might take, you know, take a few days to consider it. Uh, if, if sometimes they might make some more last minute changes and if that happens, then the policy committee might pull it back and say, we want to hear it again because these changes are so different. Um, or something that, that can also happen is what we, what we call a gut no man. And so sometimes, you know, a, you know, if you've, been working on something and you know you know it's gonna be happening, you know, that you know and the author says, okay, okay, you know, like I have this other bill that, but I think that this is so so like a so much, you know, a much higher priority. Then they'll basically scrap all the contents or a lot of the contents of one of the bills and they'll put your stuff in. Or alternatively, you guys might have a bill and the the member says, you know what, we just had this giant wild wildfire in my district and we really need a lot of money and you know I really need to address this and I don't have anywhere else to do it and I'm so sorry but we're gonna have to address this issue and we're not gonna carry your bill anymore. And so then we'll get it and then it's step of the wildfire. So that's kind of what happens. So you kinda of need to pay attention as it gets as it moves through the uh, you know as it moves through um, the second house. And so now to that, there's concurrence. So what concurrence means is that if there were amendments made in the second house, that it needs to be, then those changes need to be approved by the first house because the first house didn't get an opportunity to go and see those changes. And so the two houses basically need to agree on the bill in, you know, in its final form for it to move forward. And that's called concurrence. And then after that, it goes to the governor for consideration. So um, depending on when it's signed, the governor might have a few days to sign it, and then at, at the end of the legislative session, he has 30 days to go consider all the bills that have been passed um, by, by that deadline. And so, um, you know, the governor does get a lot of bills, and our legislature does introduce a lot of legislation. So if you guys have sponsored a bill, or you guys have, you know, supported a bill, or you guys really hate a bill, and you're just like trying to see whether it's going to be vetoed or passed, just be patient. Because the governor is looking at like generally about like a thousand to eleven hundred bills in that thirty day period, <laughs> and so it just kind of you know look every day and see you know, where it is that um you know and see if it's come up yet. Um, but uh, but yeah, there's a lot of bills that go through um, in that time, and that usually happens in September, early October. And remember, during that time, when it's when it's um, going to the governor's desk, um, either I or or I will go to the policy office. So what the board had decided to do is we're going to take the hours that's required for this course and supplement it instead having uh, change it to continuing education. Um, and so with that, when we went to the government, when we had that bill going through, because it was doing something good, it was still protecting the consumer, but also removing a barrier. Uh, what there was a concern in the governor's office that says, uh, okay, what is the purpose of continuing education? So that, that that's something that was really sensitive with the governor, and so we had to we had to clarify we're not adding continuing education requirements on it. What we're doing is removing a barrier to allow that. So those are the conversations that we have once it gets to the governor's office. Whatever thing that is sensitive to the governor's office, what he's looking at, those are things that we need to know before it goes to him, so we can work out any kind of language before he decides whether or not he's going to veto something. And so, um, also another note is that, um, you know, kind of like how I said with the policy committees is sending a letter of support or opposition or 
this top, you know, whatever your you know the board's official position is, you know, whatever position you take, if you've taken a position on a piece of legislation, when it goes to the governor, you're going to want to go and send another letter to the governor. Because if, even though you send it to the chair of the committee and you send it to the author and all that, you want to make sure that the governor knows where you stand. Because the governor might say, oh, well, you know, like, they cared about it, but I guess they don't care about it anymore. You know, so you want to make sure, you just want to reiterate your position um, and just direct your staff to do that. So here's the complete picture of the legislative process now. Um, so, mo so, so staff mostly, um, so staff mostly, you know, tracks the bills and keeps you guys updated. One thing to note, especially since, you know, I, that I kind of alluded to in the beginning, um, but I want to remind you of is that since you guys are advising the board and that all, and all board positions need to be approved before they're sent to the governor or policy committee or anything like that, you're going to want to make sure that you're anticipating these legislative deadlines because there is a very strict legislative calendar that the legislature follows. And so you're going to want to, you know, look ahead, you know, maybe six weeks, you know, or more and say, hey, you know, like, you know, the, the policy committee deadline is, you know, in, you know, the beginning of March, and, you know, we should make sure that we talk about this in our January meeting or something like that. Um, or talk to Jessica, you know, if there's some hugely urgent piece of, you know, legislation that you guys really need to weigh in on, you can talk to Jessica about possibly being, you know, out of sequence to go and do that. But the point is you need to get, you know, you need, that it needs to, you know, your positions need to be approved by the board first before they enter this process. <laughs> to add to that. Um, so the legislative process tends to move a lot quicker than uh, the board process of, of getting a meeting together. So Chris and I go over the bad week, you know, we meet exact later. Um, but one thing to really uh, know that it doesn't always jive with how fast legislation moves, which is why there's an exemption in a 10-day requirement to where we can do a 48-hour notice if it meets the parameters and pending legislation is one of them. Um, but also keep in mind that, that if, while it's 48 hours, it still takes time to get the agenda approved, to get the agenda posted. So it, it can take some time, and uh, legislation move can change by the minute. It can change overnight. Um, so those are things that to keep in mind. Um, and it really, at the end of the day, is up to the author's office to decide what they're going to do. Um, so sometimes the author's office will call us as staff and see if there's any um, technical uh, questions that, that we have or any technical amendments that we can make, but we don't make any kind of substantive decisions or any kind of position that's up to the board. And so if we feel like, you know, this one is, is substantive concern, um, we'll call a 48-hour notice to have the board address that concern. Um, otherwise, you have the potential for the legislation to go through uh, without any input from the board. Um, yeah. Okay, so like um, Jessica said, the process moves very quickly. These are kind of like the general deadlines. Um, I included in um, one of the handouts. Did you say they were this or not? They're online. Okay, good. Yeah. So then, um, so the handouts online, the one that that, um, that kind of best illustrates this is the um, legislative calendar for this year. And so these are all kind of in that calendar, and so you can just kind of take a look at just to see how fast, how they all kind of stack on top of each other very quickly. <laughs> and so, um, you know, the most important dates on that calendar, the last dates to submit bill requests to the Legislative Council, so that's to go make sure that your um, your draft is in there. Last day to introduce bills. And uh, again, this is where like a lot of those spot bills get in because you're just like, I'm not ready yet, but we know we're gonna run something. Uh, the first house deadline, and that's basically the deadline to pass out of the first house. Because if you're, um, and there are like other small deadlines leading up to that, but if your legislation, the legislation does not get out of the first house by that deadline, it's just done. Um, the last day to amend on the floor, and then the last day for bills to pass on the floor, which is similar to the first house deadline. And then of course, there's the last day for the, for the governor to sign or veto bills passed by the legislature. Um, one thing to to um, remember also that it's not really, but um, the last, but 
when the governor signs a bill, it generally goes into effect on January 1st of the following year, unless there's something in the bill that states otherwise. So you can have an urgency clause that says that this takes effect immediately, or you can say, you know what, we need a little bit more time to go and make some changes in terms of whether it's to pass regulations or make IT changes um, or something like that. We can say, you know what, we need an extra six months and so we're not implementing these, you know, so you know, you will include some language that says that the, the, the provisions will be implemented until you know July 1, 2018, or you know, or January 1st, 2019, that kind of thing. And those are the kinds of things that you know you will negotiate with the author and say, hey, you know, we need a little bit more time. And um, and, and so, uh, but other than but if those kinds of things will happen, then it happens. Then the bill goes into effect, and the board has to in, the board has to implement it by January 1st of the following year. So I kind of talked about bill positions, um, and so you guys um, won't be officially taking positions as this particular body, but you will likely be recommending some positions to be taken by the board. Um, so the, you know the position, the most common positions are support, which is yay, we like this bill, it's so great, let's do it. Neutral is like you know what, take it or leave it. Thank you. <laughs> Very neutral. Opposed is we hate it. It's awful. You know this needs to die. And then there's opposed unless amended, which is like you know this is really really awful. But if you make some changes, we'll probably be okay. So might go neutral. Um, generally, uh, we don't recommend that people do a support um, if amended or neutral if amended. If just because that's that's kind of ambiguous language because you're like, okay, we really, really like it, but then you still kind of have some problems with it. Or we're kind of, you know, we're, you know, kind of, you know, just meh about it, but we actually do have some comments, you know? So, you know, so in general, you know, we, we encourage people to go and take a more defined positions, but context does matter. So maybe there's some things where you're like, you know, this is a really great idea. We're totally on top of you. We're totally on board with you guys. But there are some technical changes that just need to be made so that we can fully implement the scope. That might be something. Um, so you know, so so just kind of keep that in mind. And of course, you know, your staff can kind of help direct you. That's something that the that the uh, the board as a whole can discuss. That you know, what positions they want to take. And then, like I said, follow up throughout the process. So once you guys take a, take a position, make sure that you know you follow up. Um, you know, with your policy committees, with the um, appropriations committees, and with the governor's office. And then one other, one other thing about positions too is, depending on when, you know, how the bill is amended through the process, you guys might decide to change your position. You know, it might be a great bill start now, but then like other people get involved and it starts to get amended, and then you're like, ooh, I don't like it anymore. You, or you say, you know what, we're super gung ho about it, but now we're just kind of lukewarm. You know, and so the, the board may, so you may recommend to the board, you know. Let's kind of back up, back off this, or like, you know, this 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 just became really bad. Let's you know, let's let's go a different direction altogether. So just kind of keep that in mind. But that's another reason why you should stay engaged throughout the entire process. Just to uh, just kind of dovetail on that, There's, that's happened before. Where you know, even with the if a board wants to sponsor a bill, the the language will all be there for the board to want to sponsor it, and then uh, say that the office office gets a lot of other. Um, ideas from stakeholders and they start making amendments to the bill, but then the board will say, you know what, that's not actually what this board what this was intended to do, and I, we think that that actually would cause potential harm to the consumer, so then we're going to remove our sponsorship and then take an imposed position. So that's happened before, so just because we sponsor something and get an author doesn't mean we're always going to support that bill because at the end of the day, it's the author. And also, I mean, we keep on kind of referring to stakeholders as if they're going to, they're the bad guys and they're here. But also, sometimes that happens with um, the, uh, the the policy committee or the, um, you know, so, so some of the committees might recommend changes and say, hey, you know, we'll pass this out of the committee if you make these certain amendments. And you might say, you know what? That's not what we were looking for. If you want, you know, if it's do or die right here, then we're, we're going to die for now. You know, we'll, we'll continue negotiations, you know, after the session kind of Thing. But um, but yeah, so so you know there are there are you know a few different ways where a bill can be amended where you feel like you need to change your position. So the sunset process. So basically, the sunset process is 
it's, it's legislative review. That's really what that means. And this is just the legislature's opportunity to review the licensure um, processes, um, time frames, that kind of thing, the disciplinary processes and time frames, um, and the uh, you know, and basically how well the board is doing in meeting their mission of consumer protection um, through licensure um, and enforcement. And so, um, so it's it's quite a long process. That you know, there is a bill related to it, but it's also got its own specific process. So the, the first part of it is um, ha is creating a sunset report, um, and that's something that um, you know staff will draft something, and then the board will review it and then make changes leading up to it, leading up to the very de to the to the deadline, for, and uh, until they submit it to the legislature. And so. The optometry board is actually going through their sunset process right now. Um, they're towards the end of their sunset process. Um, so they, there is a bill that's going through um, for the optometry board. Um, but uh, so a lot, so the, the sunset process for, or the sunset report for, for you guys happened at the end of last year, actually. So then, um, you know, in about four years, you guys as the um, party advisory committee will probably want to engage the board and say, hey, you know, these are our comments, you know, for the sunset report, and this is what we think, and this is how we, you know, how we, how we've gone, and this is how we wouldn't to say before that kind of thing. Um, and then, so after the report, there's a background paper from the committee. So this is a generally committee sponsored bill or sponsored by um, the committee chair of the business and professions committee. And so the, so, the, so the committee itself, like the, the consultant will go and make up a whole background paper about it. So we'll have a history of the board and some of the issues and some of the things that they come, they come up with. Um, and then after that, there will be a completely separate hearing outside of the bill hearing. There will be a sunset hearing for you guys. So then um, generally it's, uh, it's the board president and then Sometimes the executive officer goes up there and they testify in front of the committee, and the committee goes and says, asks all these questions about licensing, about um, the fund condition, about all kinds of things, and they have to say, hey, you are doing great, or like, you know, we're working on it, or whatever have you. Um, and then after that, the, um, you know, that the board comes up with written responses to all the issues that came up in the background paper and also came up in the hearing. So you just, it's basically your official to the response to, um, to the legislature's concerns. So then after all that's done, then comes a sunset bill. So the sunset bill goes and says, okay, you know, we've heard of all this, and this is how we're going to fix some of these issues that we've come up with. And so one of the things that um, that might be that, that happens a lot during the sunset process is that some of some major changes are made to act. Um, so for some committees, for some boards that might have Huge problems, you know. They might have an entire board sense, or they might have a huge, you know, a huge process overhaul. That kind of thing usually happens in the sunset bill. Um, some like smaller things that might happen. Might maybe they say, you know, what, we really like authority to do this, you know, this particular thing. You know, um, like we might like in this, in this year's sunset bill, there's inspection authority. Um, so it's say, you know, we want to do inspection authority, and so. Um, you know, this is something that, that the that, that the uh, that the optometry board has been discussing with the author and the, oh, excuse me, with the committee. And the committee says, you know, we agree, it's a good idea. We're putting it in there. So um, just keep that in mind that if that there, if there are some things that you feel like need to be overhauled, that's the opportunity to do it. So that's the end of the legislative process. Does anybody have any questions? I'm sorry. Well, it is the opportunity to do it. You also want to stray with many things that's like controversial uh, that that might end up being if it's like that's the issue and everybody is opposed to it uh, it could run the potential of sunsetting the board and you see well while you do it is a good opportunity to try to tackle some issues if it's a huge controversial issue in itself I would recommend a different avenue than your sunset yeah, and then and, and you know, the sunset bill is just like any other bill where like you put something in there and you get some feedback that everybody's like all crazy about and say, you know what, we're just gonna take this part out and we're gonna visit another time. You know, so um, you know, obviously be cognizant of what you can and can't can get done. Um, because like Jessica said, you know, this is a sunset bill because that means that the the board sunset, the board would go away if the bill was not passed. Um, okay. Yes. Yeah, there might be an additional slide for uh, 
bills that are negotiated in private and uh, kept close to the vest and are poorly drafted might have uh, conflicting provisions or incomplete provisions and the board might not have an opportunity to have, uh, uh, the board members might not have an opportunity to have uh, an impact on what that legislation would say. Yeah, so I mean, it was, when things like that happen more often, you get you the board feels like the side, like, like all of a sudden there's like some legislation that you're like, oh, you know, holy moly, like we didn't know this was happening and now it's here. Obviously, that still needs to go through the process and to the governor's does and the governor still needs to figure out whether we want to sign or not. So that would be the process. So the governor's, um, you know, a letter to a governor, to the governor would be their opportunity to say, you know what, this is a good idea or this is a terrible idea. So that was that's kind of like your last ditch effort to say, please do this. <laughs> yes. There's no bill passed in California. It's not public. It's a public process. So there's nothing done in secret in the state of California when it comes to passing laws. That's that's true, but even in California, some might say the process has been improved, or in fact, people in Sacramento right now might know it might even be hindered. Uh, There's recently a ballot proposition that forced legislation to be in print for three days because of past processes that, well, perhaps technically public, weren't really transparent. And so that's just like an an awful pendulum swing back that now at the end of the session, you gotta wait three days and it's it's kind of up. Well, like Jessica said earlier, you know, if something, you know, that, so if there's a piece of legislation or if there's some amendments that make made in the process, because like just like, you know, like you both said, you know, it's a very fast made process. So, you know, um, if something drops and is made public, you know, that the language is something that the board, you know, vehemently disagrees with and feels that they, need, that they really, really need to take action on, then, you know, there are, then there is a way to go and meet so that you can take a position to, you know, have some formal opposition to that bill before the governor signs it. Um, and that's something that, you know, the, that you know, we would make sure that, um, you know, you guys have, you know, have, you know try, our, try, to, try to, our very best to make sure that, that the board has the opportunity to do that and the RU committee has the opportunity to wait on that. For the record, the stakeholders are not bad guys. Yeah, no, absolutely. Really? Thank you. Thank you. No, and I just wanted to say something to the record, too. You know, I, I think you're referring to AP684. And, um, you know, it's really too bad. I think the board was a few meetings in there. That's how I know that. Yeah. Right. Um, but I think all of us were kind of moving along that process, and there's absolutely no intent not to walk with you. Right. Um, so, I mean, for the industry, you just. No, if it's taken, I understand the process, but since I was on the board at the time, uh, that wasn't the feeling of the members of the board. So there was obviously a disconnect. And the whole reason we're here today is because of 684. Without that, we're not here. So um, that might be the most important legislative process to learn about. It is our origin story. Um, but even today, you had to explain part of that legislative history to the executive officer of our board. And that's that's tragic. Because it moves so quickly. I understand. I, I, it was complicated. And because it was quick, it was yep. not perfect. Yeah. Or, or so, sloppy. So I guess also one other thing that, um, you know, is it, that it was kind of overlooked just in, in, in terms of describing the legislative process is that this is that the legislative session actually lasts two years. So this, so that the process that I just described actually happens twice. And so for bills that are introduced um, in the first year, if you know you guys feel like that the um, you know if it's your if it's your bill or you know if it's, if it's a stakeholder bill or if it's an author bill, you know author author uh, act, you know sponsored bill that you know you guys just that the the three of you guys just cannot figure you know the the associations, the board, and the author just are at an impasse. You can say, you know what, we're putting this on hold, we're going to discuss this at a later time, we're going to make this a two-year bill. And so that's basically, uh, like, you know, you know, that can be considered a commitment to take that up again the following, um, the following year and put that, you know, put that in the, some legislation the following year. Um, there are many, you know, and, and one thing that's also, that's also true is that even though the process does happen quickly, 
um, you know, depending on your relationship with your stakeholders, you know, you can go and, and say, hey, you know what, let's continue negotiations and make sure that, you know, it's gonna, it might take, you know, two legislative sessions, so four, four full years, for us to all come out and find a workable solution. But that's something that's, um, you know, that, that is actually like quite common. I think that's something that, you know, people aren't really aware of um, during the legislative process. Okay, so that it is incredibly difficult in the legislative process doing it every day. That cap and trade is a great example. That you work for years on a solution, mm -hmm. or you've worked for years on 684, to be fair, um, based on various perspectives on that. And then to have the process come down to the last really month because that bill was in print for a while, so in, in, in various versions for the month. But to be, to be what, what I really liked about the process is what happened in this room. The administration wanted to move the program over, and the stakeholders wanted to make sure that the registered dispensing competitions had a voice at the table when that was moved over. So that process vetted this voice. So we hope that that voice and your, the work you do and the work we do together does improve the tenets of that legislation and improve the program. So that was a key part of that last tail end of the deal is merging the program was important to the administration and us having a voice at the table in that process was important to the stakeholders. So that's really how why we, that's really why we all think we're here is to improve those processes. It was a last minute bill, but that Cap and trade came together. So, um, any additional um, questions, comments about the um, legislative process before we move on? Okay. So, now we're into the regulatory process. So, this is actually the slide that's different than what's on the um, website because we just recently revised our um, internal process. And so, that's so we wanted to update our graphic to report that. Um, so for uh, the regulatory process, this is also called the rulemaking process, um, and so they're one and the same. Um, and so just so you guys don't get um, confused about that, when people say you know, call it the rulemaking process, the regulations process is the same thing. Um, like the um, previous presenter before me said, you know, the reg or just they describe the regulation. You know, just to paraphrase, you know, regulation is a rule, regulation or standard of procedure. It can also be loosely called a guideline or a policy. Basically, if your board is making decisions on the guidance rule policy, or guidance rule policy, et cetera, then it needs to be go through the formal rulemaking process. You know, so if you say, I mean, there's there's something, you know, there's, you know, there's two, it's different when you say, oh, these are our top ten tips to make sure you have, you know, everything together for your application versus, you know, these are the, the ten things you need to have in order to be considered for licensure. You know, one is just a recommendation of like, hey, you know, if you don't have these, it's not it's not a make or break. The other one is a make or break. If it's a make or break, you need to go through the rulemaking process. And so just to kind of describe the graphic here, you know, we have a little light bulb, the idea, um, our DCA logo, logo that's, that's the department, the Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency, that's the agency that um, the Department of Consumer Affairs and you guys are under. Um, that's a sample of little sample of this right here is for, you know, this thing out. There's a thinking guy. So we're gonna talk about some deadlines too. Um, and then also it goes, the rule goes through a second round of review with PCA. And then of course it ends up um, with another state entity to approve it. So first one is language development. So very similar to um, the legislative process, you know, it can, the language development can come from a few different places. Um, it can, but ultimately it is put in place by uh, by the board. So say, you know, the, uh, you know, you guys are kind of, uh, uh, you know, coming up with some stuff and you say, oh, we're discussing th some things, and one of your stakeholders says, you know what, actually we've been working on something, on something very similar for a while, you know, let's share some information for, with you, and you know, like, you guys look it over, and if you like it, let's move forward, you know, that's totally a thing, you know, um, or another agency should say, hey, you know, this would be really great if you know, we made some changes here, you guys should also make some conforming changes because there's some crossover here. Um, so, you, you know, so you come up with this policy, policy concept, and you, you, know, you run it by the board and you run it by um, the appropriate entities. 
So this is what I was talking about when I said the initial reg you know, regulation review process. So this is our internal process. And so this is the first page of the um, two-page document that was at the end of the um, regulations, um, regulations presentation. And so what this actually does is this kind of describes where we're going here. And so the internal review process is everything from you know what happens at the board but to what happens at the department. So basically, um, the board kind of comes with some language. The board approves it, says, hey, this is what we want to move forward with, runs it by the right, runs it by legal, and then they go and they create a whole rulemaking package um, or regulations package. The packet includes the request for, a, for approval of regulations, the notice of proposed changes, any forms that are incorporated by reference in the uh, proposed language, because believe it or not, a form itself is a regulation. So an application form, that's a regulation. So you can include a copy of that. Um, an initial statement of reasons, reasons, also called an ISOR. So when you hear people talking about an ISOR, not talking about like I, but I mean like this word, the initial statement of reasons. Um, the underlying data that you re that you referenced in the ISOR. So if you say, oh, you know, we're making this, you know, we're, you know, we've chosen these disciplinary guidelines because, you know, that we've seen so many violations in this area. Well, you need to provide some data to back up that you've seen so many violations. So that's so a um, you would that. Uh, completed form 499, which is basically your um, economic and fiscal analysis, um, that is uh, reviewed by the Department of Finance. And then also the enabling statutes also pull the authority and reference citations. Um, so like uh, you know, like what was previously stated, these are the things that give you guys the actual authority to say, hey, you can make this rule. Um, and uh, so you need to go and include that to let you know to let everybody else who's gonna be reviewing it that hey, we actually do have authority to make this rule. So after it goes through our internal review process, um, it, uh, it is publicly noticed. Um, so this is to OVL, it's publicly noticed. And after it's publicly noticed, then you have a 45-day comment period of the hearing. So this is, the, this is where the public gets to weigh in. When I, when I say the public, this means their stakeholders, this means people who are affected by it, people who are in the general public and say, hey, you know what, I have something to say, I want to put it And um, so you, and the thing is, you guys have to consider all of it. Even if somebody goes and says, I think this is a terrible idea and I have zero alternatives, but I think it's terrible, you actually have to say, you have to, have to consider and say like, is this a terrible idea? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know and see if you agree with it or not. Um, so that's, a, so yes, yeah, so, so there's, so that's what this comment period is for. And you have to have a public hearing too, right? Kind of similar to how it is where the public is invited and you know, you go and hear, you know, they have an opportunity to comment. Um, amending the language. So after you get the comments, you go and you say, okay, like, you know, were some of them great? Or some of them help the process and make this a better regulation? Or some of them just like a thank you for your input kind of comment, you know? Um, and so if you do decide to go and make some, um, some amendments, um, if it's a minor amendment, so say somebody says, you know what, that's not the term that we usually use, you know, in, or, you know, in, in our everyday language and it's not really understandable, can you guys do this one instead or, or something like that? Then it needs to be re. Um, then, you have, then you have to reopen a comment period for a 15 day comment. So basically saying this is a new, you know, these are the new. This is a new language. There are some technical, like little ticky tack things that were done. You, you know, everybody has 15 days to do it. If you're going to do a huge substantive overhaul, and, and because you decided that you want to go a different direction based on some of the feedback that you got, then you have to go and open it again for a 45 day comment period. And um, just internally, we you know. If it is just a huge overhaul, and you know, the, we kind of recommend that maybe you should consider possibly restarting the process. Because if you're making a huge overhaul, you, you definitely want to make sure that it goes through that review so that you have all the supporting documentation that you need to go and do the process. I mean, you're going to have to do 45 day comment periods anyway, so the yeah, extra review might help. Or might help. And so then after so then after you go and you do that, you go and you you um, put together your state your your uh, final statement of reasons and it goes to the department it goes back to the department. And so when the department gets it, 
we look it over, and then we also send it to the agency so they can so they can approve it. And at the same time, it goes to to our agency. It goes to the Department of Finance, so, so the Department of Finance can go and say, okay, this is a you know we approve the fiscal impact. We know that you've stated. We you know we approve the um, economic impact that you've stated. And so once it's all done, and you and you know, yes. What is the California Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency do? So that that's the agency that we're all under. So the department is under the agency, and you guys are. Got it. Got yeah. it. Got it. Okay. Yes. So there are. Um, yeah, there are parents. Um, so then after all of that, then it goes to the Office of Administrative Law. And don't let the, the name fool you, the Office of Administrative Law is in a separate department. Even though it's, in the it's a completely separate department, and all they do is basically approve regulations. That's their, that's their job, is to go review and approve it. And so there's you know a team of lawyers that says, hey, is this, you know, do all these things make sense? You know, do we have proper justification? And do we, do, do, do we have, you know, is everything there that we say yes? We can move forward with this rule. And so, if, if they disapprove it, so if they approve it, yay! <laughs> if they disapprove it, then you basically have to start over and amend your regulation. Um, so they will, so they will submit um, an opinion to you saying this is why we disapproved your regulation, and then you go and you make your changes. And um, you have 120 days, I believe, to um, finish the process. So this is actually very, very important, especially since you guys are going to be doing a lot of regulations. This is super important. Um, so these are their review standards. I mean, you, basically, if you guys don't meet these, there's five of them. So if you if you guys don't meet, meet if your regulation does not meet these review standards, it will not be approved. They will say nope. You know, you gotta make some changes. So the first one is necessity. So your, you know, all your supporting documentation, you know, your narrative, everything says this is why we need to make this change. This is why it's important. If we don't make this change, you know, we can't, we can't carry out our mission. The authority. So the authority is the specific statute that says you guys can make rules about this particular thing. You know, so like for fees, it'll say. You know that you know that the board may promulgate fees for you know, for this particular license type. It's not your general rulemaking authority. It's just saying we you can do it for this specific thing. Um, clarity. So written so that the meeting can be easily understood. And so some of, some of, some of the regulations that I've seen that have been disapproved are things that use a lot of like um, you know industry jargon. As a consumer, I don't know what that means. Or they use a lot of acronyms. Acronyms. I don't know what that means. But we all know what that means. So you need to go and make sure that your regulation is written in a way that is clear to everybody who reads it. And the standards are also at sorry, at government code section eleven three forty nine. You guys can look that up. Oh, so the fourth one is consistency. So basically making sure that's consistent, not only with existing statutes, but also with existing regulations. Because you don't want to go and confuse people and say, oh, we're trying to, you know, uphold this, but then you can't really do it over here or over here. So definitely make sure that, or basically definitely try to make sure that it's consistent with, uh, with everything else. Reference. So this is the broader rulemaking authority. So this is the thing that says you can make, you can, you can make rules, that this body has the power to make rules. And then non-duplication. So this is basically more like just don't be redundant. So if you have, so say for example, you have a statute that says, um, you know, the fee shall be forty-five dollars. You'll need a regulation that also says the fee shall be forty-five dollars because the statute already says that. You know, it's unnecessary and redundant. So, but if you know if it says you know the fee shall be forty-five dollars and up to a hundred, then you can go and then you're not duplicating. You know, because then you have to say, okay, well, we want to do 55, and this is one. So yeah, so it's making sure that you're not duplicating stuff that's already there. Does so anybody have any questions about the standards? Um, so quarterly effective dates. So basically, these effective dates are in place so that the folks who are going to be affected by it know when to expect new stuff. Um, so if you're the, if OPA makes a decision on your um, regulation, you know, the first column, then it becomes effective in the second column. So on a quarterly basis. The exceptions are that 
there's an effective date statute. So if you know, if, so if you have to be, if it has, has to be, the program has to be implemented on January 1st, you know, excuse me, 2019, and it was passed, you know, and the, and the regulation was approved on December 15th, then it's going to go into effect on, you know, on January 1st of that following year, because that's when the statute says stuff in the you know, government the statute goes into effect. Or if a later date is requested, so say again, like you know, to go and do, to go and uh, you know, uh, implement these regulations, kind of like the same reasons for for um, for legislation is that if you need time to make your IT changes or something like that, then you, know, you might want to have say, hey, you know, we need a little bit of time. You know, we're going to go and um, we can could we have it a later date? Can we have it six months out instead of four? Um, earlier date requested, so you can say, hey, you know, we really, really, really need this now, and we, and we provided some justification for it. Can you please, you know, make this effective earlier? And then and they may or may not. And then fish and wildlife are exempt for whatever reason. <laughs> so this is the complete picture of the regulatory process. So, you know, you have your policy concept that's been vetted by everybody. Um, it's internally, initially invited by everybody. It goes to the department, and we do our own internal review. That's the, you know, and, and the department act itself actually does, um, they, they do a legal analysis, a fiscal analysis, and then also a analysis for other content, which is And then it goes to our agency, it's publicly noticed, you guys will be hearing, you consider your stakeholder input, and you know, on the technical stuff, and also the policy stuff, make your minor amendments, and for major amendments, and then it goes back to the department, and then it goes and uh, it goes straight to OAL, and you either get approved or disapproved. And like I said, if it gets disapproved, then you have to go all the way back to the amendments. And so. so before we talk about this, does anybody have any questions on the regulations? Yes. Maybe both for statutory and regulatory. We went and discussed more here on the Antitrust and Air Space and the Antitrust and Air Space. We went and discussed how to do the work. Um, we, we provide, we have given North Carolina uh, comments before uh, to, to the board. Sorry. <clears throat> uh, we've given we've given North Carolina training and information to board members in prior sessions. We also, the department's board member orientation training, provide North Carolina information as well. So it is a subject that the board members are aware of. So, um, lastly, you know, developing a process for your board staff, both for your regulations and for legislation, to make sure that you know you guys can not only follow legislation in a way and appropriately, but also so that your regulations keep on moving, so you can implement things in you know, a timely manner. So um, have a designated staff member at your program who can track and assess bills, draft analyses, and present at board, at board meetings, and draft and oversee regulations. So um, you do something, like I said, to kind of keep up with everything. Um, you should also establish expectations for this person or for these people. Um, you know, if you want something, you gotta ask for it. <laughs> and, you know, nobody in here is a mind reader. Um, and so definitely just make your expectations um, uh, aware of that person. Um, you know, develop some standards, um, some standard procedures and some, and some templates. So maybe it's just like, okay, after every board meeting, you know, you want something from that person. And so you do that, convey that to that person and, and you know, and set up, you know, some uh, expectations for that. Um, so, you know, yeah, we want, you want it for me to buy email or something like that. Um, and then discuss and then discuss major policies as a, you know, as a advisory, advisory committee, but also as a board. But then delegate the details to staff because as you, know, as you may have gotten a sense of you know as we're going through the process, there's a lot. There's a lot. You know when you're going through both of these processes, there's a lot going on. You know when you're in, with such, with the uh, with legislative changes, you know they're it's just trying to keep up with the amendments and you know weigh in and all that stuff and making sure that you know that you're doing things at the right time. But the regulations is making sure that everything that you, know, you have everything together and that you know you have all your data and you have all you know your um, responding to people when you're you know they're going through the process, which can be very onerous for um, folks who don't do it on a daily basis. <laughs> so um, 
definitely delegate those little details of staff. And so, you know, one of those things is you know just recommending, you know, recommending uh, to the board you know, some act, some follow-up actions for your staff if you know, if they choose to come to the decision. So, and that's it. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs>